All right. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're dialing in from. Uh, welcome to the SAME Alternative Delivery Methods uh, to Deliver Federal Construction Projects webinar. Thank you so much for attending. I know this was a relatively short notice event uh, that we were able to pull together uh, in order to uh, meet some uh, pretty pretty uh, strict uh, schedules that we're trying to adhere to. Um, I don't have the exact numbers right now, but I suspect there's going to be well over 400 people that will be part of our webinar today, which is incredibly exciting for us. Ideally, this would have been done as an in-person event. Uh, when I was told there was an opportunity to do something with the Honolulu Post, I was incredibly excited. Uh, and then I found out later it was virtual. So um, I'm still very happy, but I'm virtually happy. So um, the event that we've got set up for you today uh, is uh, very unique and one that's going to, um, I think, offer everyone a great opportunity uh, to learn a little bit more about what's happening with alternative delivery. Um, this is literally the starting point of what we hope becomes a series of really robust conversations and discussions that occur uh, over the next several weeks. And you're going to hear me hit that theme with a couple of our speakers. More importantly, at the very end of our webinar, uh, you're going to hear about where we're going next. Uh, this is the agenda uh, in front of us. We're going to go through uh, several different perspectives, and we have some tremendous speakers uh, to help do that with us today. Um, oh, we don't want to play that video yet. Um, in terms of if you have not been on one of our um, events yet using Big Marker, uh, you've got the chat feature, which allows you to uh, go in and uh, make uh, comments, make uh, uh, add some commentary or whatever what's going on. If you have actual questions, um, I ask you to use the Q and A. Uh, tab, which is uh, right next to the chat tab at the right side of your screen. And all the uh, questions that we uh, pick up during our webinar, if we cannot address now, we will ensure that we answer them with either one of our speakers or go back and do some homework and then uh, come back and make sure that everyone knows what, uh, what the answer to those questions were. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to our our host post, this was supposed to be Colonel uh, Jim Hoyman, uh, the post president, but Jim got called away on some duty. So uh, Seth, if you're out there, uh, bring your camera up. There we go. So here's uh, Seth Lormer. Uh, it looks like Seth looks like you are deployed or something. Looks like you're in uh, Afghanistan or, or <laughs> some, some uh, cheap mylar on the window. What's going on there? Yeah, just just trying to uh, balance uh, multiple people teleworking in the same house. Uh, normally I'd be in the office, but uh, for today, I tried to uh, to do this from home to make sure all the telecom would work. So, okay. yep, here I am in the laundry room, uh, stuck in the back closet. Well, you know, it, it, it's it's a little bit easier on me not seeing the palm trees and everything else swaying in the background, where I'm sure it's another Chamber of Commerce day in Honolulu. So, tell you what, um, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and go off camera for a second. I'll let you do your intro, and I'll be right back when you're done. All right, thanks, Sal. Hey, aloha everyone from Honolulu. Uh, Sal mentioned my name's uh, Major Seth Lormer and on behalf of Colonel Jim Hoyman, uh, the SAME Honolulu Post President, we're excited to play host to today, uh, albeit virtual. I know many of you wish you were here in person soaking up the sun and aloha spirit uh, as you'd like to you know, check out the view in Waikiki uh, and iconic Diamond Head Crater. Uh, it's a beautiful picture, um, but also uh, we're a vibrant pro post, uh, 650 strong across the military and industry. Um, Oahu is a gathering place, uh, and it's fitting that uh, we're at the seat of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command today. Um, all the military component commands, uh, Navy facilities, uh, the command of the Pacific, uh, USACE, um, the Pacific o Ocean Division, we're excited to have over 100 um, sustaining organizations that have been a uh, part of our post uh, and on an island that's only 30 by 44 miles. It's hard to go unknown. So we're a wonderful community and a great Ohana. Uh, we're excited uh, for you to join us today. Uh, but I know you didn't come to hear about our post. Uh, we're here to talk about delivery. A quick perspective as an engineer serving in the Indo, uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, our number one priority is delivering uh, in our division, the theater infrastructure master plan uh, for the Indo-Pacific. Perhaps you may have heard uh, of the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. It's a hot topic coming out of uh, the NDAA this year. 
uh, in view of the PDI, our infrastructure plan sets the course to deliver projects that will appropriately posture U.S. forces for great uh, power competition with China in the years to come. This is no small task, particularly as we go into remote places uh, with little existing infrastructure, labor force, or uh, construction materials and equipment. Honing our understanding of these skills and processes, infrastructure delivery is absolutely imperative uh, for us to meet uh, this, glo uh, this challenge in the global context. We have collective charge uh, to do uh, what is uh, to do better than what we've done before. And in the words of our deputy commander at Indopaycom, Lieutenant General Minahan, uh, as he kicked off the Service for engagement uh, two weeks ago, this is our professional obligation. Uh, to support a, a rules-based order and combat the rising challenge of peer competition across the globe. And I'm thrilled that we're here to embark on this task. Uh, some more thanks to our Pacific region team, uh, President Eric Warner, uh, for the continued outstanding support of the Honolulu Post. And finally, again, thank you to the SAME national team for spearheading this event uh, and very relevant webinar. Mahalo and Nui Lo. Uh, back over to you, Sal. Thanks, Seth. Uh, good luck with your uh, your uh, bunker there, and uh, hopefully you can get everything back to ship shape as soon as possible. Thanks for joining us. All right, so let's uh, let's move on here. Um, we have literally the best of the best uh, that are going to be talking to you today. Um, if, uh, if I did not introduce myself at the top of the hour, I should have. My name is Sal Najumian, um, former Air Force uh, Colonel, civil engineer type and uh, currently the um, Chief Executive Officer of Matrix Design Group. Uh, joining me today uh, for this uh, webinar, we've got four outstanding speakers. We've got Mr. Mike McAndrew, who of course is the Deputy Secretary of Defense for Construction. Uh, Mike will be kind of setting the stage, uh, the burning platform, if you will, if uh, why we're having this webinar today and where we hope to be going in the immediate future. Uh, we've got Dr. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Pat Silverman, uh, Pat is also a former Air Force uh, civil engineer and is now uh, in charge of the Construction Sciences Department at Texas A&M University. And if you haven't looked into Texas A&M's uh, program, they are industry leaders in, in what's happening out there. Uh, then we've got uh, Army uh, retired Colonel Mike Rossi. Uh, Mike uh, was a district commander, uh, can speak to alternative delivery methods, both from his time in uniform and now in industry. So giving a little bit of a combined um, IG perspective, industry and government perspective. So you've got uh, Mr. McAndrew with OST, you've got uh, Pat giving us academic, we're gonna have Mike uh, talking about a bit of a bridge. And then finally, Mr. Mike Costas, uh, who is one of the general managers with Bechtel for uh, defense and space. And Mike will be talking about some highly successful projects that have been uh, brought to market using some of the uh, techniques that uh, uh, earlier speakers will be talking about. So without any further ado, um, Mike uh, McAndrew, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you to uh, perspective and uh, get us off and running. Okay, all right, thanks you, Sal. And I wanna thank um, the SME and the, the uh, Honolulu Post for, for sponsoring this. This is really, really a timely uh, um, discussion to have on, on a very important topic. Um, it, it really dovetails with what I'm trying to do with Mill County Reform writ large. You know, we've had many for the last couple of years uh, engagements with SAME through JETSI, uh, small business conferences, and uh, we, we, you know, those were geared towards trying to get um, industry perspectives on how how business goes on and how we do business within that within that mindset. Uh, given that you know we haven't had a really great track record on some important projects the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, back in the day when, when uh, uh, Lucian Neumeyer was my boss, he was uh, pushing and urging me to try to come up with processes to, to ensure we get better product delivery, both uh, schedule and cost. And the Hill has, has also been, been on our cases uh, over what's going on, We're trying to come up with some, some ideas and how to sit there and bring projects in, uh, you know, when we need them. And, and it is really about the warfighter. I want to remind everybody, um, you know, the, the, you know, People may think that the engineers and the whole facility community are support elements, but I view those support elements as nothing more than an extension of the warfighter. They, I mean, nothing really starts or ends without the infrastructure we um, provide or maintain. 
And uh, so they can't do their missions with unless we're doing our mission correctly. And uh, getting stuff in on time is part of that. And I know we do a good job of that. I mean, this is this isn't one where we're gonna, we're going to sit there and say we're failing miserably, but we have again some important projects that, for one reason or another, um, and I and I Mike McAndrew touts it as a lot of those reasons are pre-award type activities that could be done better. But what, as we go into award, what the way we approach the project and way our uh, our, our acquisition strategy is is uh, built, I think is going to be just as important because anything we can do to avoid hiccups uh, during execution um, is going to just make the project go smoother. And one of those things that I think we've learned through some of the case studies we've done in the past is that communication and better understanding of uh, of the project uh, between all parties is important. And that means bringing our designers and our construction agents, our construction agents and the construction contractors in early enough in the projects with the project sponsors. So, you know, that that's where I think this alternative uh, uh, delivery methodology is, is really going to help us out. And one of the things I really want to stress, um, you know, whether we call this thing contract management at risk or ECI, I've heard many different terms for the same thing. Um, is, is just that, how we communicate with one another. One of the things I've been talking to the services about over the last couple of years um, has been trying to get us into one body of, of, dis, of, of ling, uh, language, lingo, um, nomenclature, however you want to call it. Um, because you know what, what we do in the facility world really has a little bearing on whether uh, we're wearing an Army, Navy, or Air Force uniform. Um, and so we, we don't need to sit there and tailor the language to each one of those different cultures. And that's that's one of the things I'd really like to hear about how we, from industry perspective, can uh, you know learn from uh, the way you do business. And I'm sure between companies you have differences too. And I, and I'm, I really do understand that. But uh, where I want to begin the conversation is you know how do we standardize off of a, a, a good practice in industry. Um, and I think everybody out there realizes that uh, the way the government does business, we do have uh, laws, uh, you know, uh, regulations, FAR, DFAR, that we have to kind of follow. Um, not kind of, we do have to follow. Um, but I, I would argue and, and stress to, um, to, to everyone that we keep in mind where we deviate from a standard and then to ask ourselves clearly, why, why are we deviating and is it necessary? Now, if a statute tells us to, okay, we're going to change, but I would also encourage both the DOD and industry side to kind of say, is that really necessary today? Because one of the things we don't do a really good job of in government is once we make rules, we never try to either change them or get rid of them when we feel that their time has expired. Uh, and I'd like to see us challenge those going forward. Uh, you know, as we get through some of these things, you know, engaging with the contracting and the legal community and say, I think we're about done with this rule because I think it's, you know, it's, it, we, we've learned from it. It doesn't need to be there. The practice is pretty solid. Let's kind of see if we can do away with it and get the help we can either from the Hill or the, the uh, federal uh, procurement set, uh, individuals to uh, modify those, those rules. So, um, so one of the things that uh, I, I really want to hear from, and I think the panelists are going to do a really great uh, job on, is talking about their experiences with an alternative method. Um, and, and I really you know, encourage you know, the DOD folks that are on the line today to, to think about that as they go forward. Think about um, in, you know, how, how open-minded are we to change? Because uh, again, when we start talking culture, you know, my 35 years of experience in, in the federal government, um, people kind of get uh, ingrained in the way they think and the way they do things. It gets into the culture, it gets into, uh, you know, we did it this time, we did it this way last time, it worked fine, let's do it again. And they don't really look at the situation, the circumstances, that maybe something can be done differently to get a better product. Because it's not a bad thing also to come in with a project early and under budget. So, um, you know, we have to really kind of keep continually challenging ourselves on why we're doing what we're doing and making sure it is the best way to do it. Um, you know, we don't need to wait for the next uh, business initiative uh, like Black Belt or Green Belt to say, let's look at our process. We can be doing this all along, talking and consulting with industry. I know Admiral Corkett does that quite frequently, and I'm sure that uh, General Spellman has, has teams out there talking to industry. But we really got to be understanding is what's going on in industry that changes that we can adopt, we can, we can take advantage of. And then when we think we're going to adopt it or we want to adopt it, 
we don't do something so onerous as trying to modify it to say, hey, we got we to gotta make this a core of engineers or NAVFAC product or process that we can maybe adopt it as it is, as long as it meets the statutory and, and regulatory requirements that we have. Um, so again, uh, I think that we, that's one thing we can do. And, um, and, and I think that we're, uh, we're, we're going to have here some pretty good processes today. And, uh, and with that, I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully good, some good time in the chat to see if you guys have good questions or questions that we can answer and see if we can move on with this. So Sal, that's my opening. All right. Thanks, Mike. You know, um, Mr. McAndrew and his team have been working on this for um, for some time. And, you know, he, he made reference earlier to getting a little bit of pressure from our friends on the Hill uh, for, for project delivery and things like that. And uh, a lot of uh, Mike's team and we've been working in conjunction with them. Just to put this problem in perspective, uh, we took a look at um, I, I don't want to misquote my numbers. So if anybody on my team wants to put the right numbers in the chat box, please do this. But I think we looked at about eight to 10 years of Milcon data. And I think we had good records for about 1300 projects that have been uh, executed with the appropriate amount of data within the system to measure. And of that only 42, 40, 42% or something like that of projects actually came in on time uh, and or budget. So in other words, uh, a huge portion were either schedule overruns, uh, I think greater than six months, uh, or PA overruns of two million or, or some odd 125 percent of PA or, or or something of those of those lines. But the bottom line is um, there's a there's plenty of room for improvement. And as Mr. McAndrew stated, uh, we know we're not the only ones that are doing this. Uh, Admiral Corka and his team have been outstanding. Um, um, Admiral Adamants and, and and his guys have been working on this stuff. We've been working in concert with them. Uh, and USACE themselves have a lot of programs going. This is just yet another arrow, uh, if you will, in that quiver where we're trying to improve this uh, delivery and, and looking at alternative methods is uh, uh, very uh, timely. So uh, with that, let me go ahead and transition to our next speaker. Um, we are very fortunate to have Pat with us today. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'll let him kind of go through his resume, to, uh, why he is more than highly qualified to be talking to us today. Uh, but we are very fortunate to have him with us. Uh, great seeing you, Pat. It's been a few years. And uh, thanks for taking some time to uh, share your academic perspective with us. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, um, I, I'm not going to talk about myself very much, but I, I do always find that it helps everyone know where you stand to see where you came from. And uh, I was excited. I was getting some texts. I, I know that uh, some of the people who I've done construction work with in the past are on this call today. And so Many of you were my mentors and, and others were my coworkers. So I'm excited to, to talk about my experiences today. And, and I think all of us know that this is needed. We have over 400 people who are saying that construction is not going well. And so my part is gonna be a little bit of a primer on just some of the types of terms like Mr. McAndrew talked about. Uh, but then we're really gonna deep dive into some of the innovative things that Mike Rossi and then uh, uh, the other Mike has done, Mike Costas. And so, um, Moving forward, I'm gonna, here's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about some do's versus some don'ts. Uh, then I'm just gonna talk about some of my perspectives and then also resources that you may or may not know about. Uh, I, I'm, I continuously find people who don't know about some of the best tools out there for what is available. And you, gotta, you have to know about those things so that you can be informed and, and prepared. And then lastly, I'm gonna go over some recommendations all through the lens of a lot of the different projects that I've had the opportunity to work on while either being an academic at the Air Force Academy or here at Texas A&M for the last four years, leading the largest construction program in the country. Um, and the first thing I'll say on the do versus don't is almost every time I show construction photos, I know there's somebody out there right now saying, why isn't he wearing a hard hat? And the reason I'm not wearing a hard hat, Jason Roberts knows he's on this session, but this was the 4th of July. This was the day that we handed over uh, Delta ramp to uh, the boss function at Camp Bastion uh, to the Brits. And so it was in the process of turning over from a construction project into an actual airfield where, as you know, you don't wear headgear out on the airfield. And so that's my first do versus don't. Yes, I know you should wear hard hats and high-vis vests, but not when you're out on the airfield. So uh, going on to my next do versus don't. Took a little bit of a risk, but I wanted to take you back about 30 years. I know it's not Thursday, but I wanna give you a quick throwback here. Um, 
Charlie Cool is another person who works with Matrix, and I, I hope I don't offend him, but uh, the rock of the 60s went through Woodstock, and then sadly by 1990, this is what their rock forefathers brought forward. Their best they could do was Nelson. Nelson uh, were the twin bleached blonde brothers of Ricky Nelson, and they sang a song called I Can't Live Without Your Love and Affection. And I think it was interesting that the processed cheese rock uh, hair glam bands, uh, that's what they had finished out as in 1990, but only about six months later, up comes this upstart band from Seattle and, and the rest is history. We all know Nirvana uh, took a risk. They connected with people. Uh, they had authentic rock music again, and they wound up selling 30 million albums as opposed to Nelson's 2 million. And so I'm going to ask, ask you to think about things today. Think about uh, both of them knew how to play guitars. Uh, one of them probably broke them more often, but just like my boss used to say, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. I want you to break a few guitars out there. So let's let's be creative, but let's first see some basics, okay? So that leads into my favorite quote, which is from Thomas Kuhn. Uh, obviously, a, a, an old quote is before I was born, but uh, he's the same person that came up with the paradigm shift reference. But his quote exactly was that the successful scientist must think like a traditionalist and an iconoclast. But I would say people in architecture, engineering, and construction uh, need to do that. And I have a good example of why of why they do need to do that. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about a few of the resources that I, you have to know about first before we can talk about anything else. Uh, one of those was, if you think back a long time ago, there used to be something called a construction criteria base. Uh, I know there were predecessors before that, but I, I remember probably 15, 20 years ago, it was new that we sent out CD-ROMs of all of the the UFCs and the standards that we had in the Air Force and the Army and NAVFAC. And as you can tell, I worked with different uh, projects, both in NAVFAC areas as well as USACE areas. Um, but now it's all on the whole building design guide. There are so many things in the whole building design guide that really, if you get in there first and then you go in the search bar, there's standard designs. Uh, there are all the AFIs and many of the AFIs recently with all the reorg, especially in the Air Force, have been updated. So make sure you're using the, the most updated up-to-date guidance, make sure you're searching for the standard designs. Uh, Mr. McAndrew referenced many of them uh, are on the whole building design guide and they've been put there at, at great cost already to the taxpayers. So use what's already out there. Similarly, uh, you might've been used to the e-commerce business daily, uh, which was the, the web version of the, of the CBD. Well, uh, fall of 20, it was in beta mode, but now it has been activated. It, all of that is on sam.gov. So you go get a secure login. That's where you can see the, the types of things you used to see on e-commerce business daily. So you need to know about that. And as many others are going to talk about, always under the watchful eye of the federal acquisition regulation. But as two other speakers are going to talk about here, uh, if it's not stated in the FAR, that means you probably can do it. So that's I, I want people to be thinking flexibly about uh, the types of things that industry is already doing that we might have been holding them up on. So, uh, which brings me to my first story here. So, uh, being here at Texas A&M, we have 1,173 students. We have 250 firms in our construction industry advisory council at the beginning of COVID. Uh, it's dropped off a little bit now as, as hiring has, has slowed, but uh, we have great partnerships with people all over the world, but we had a, a very large grocery retailer, I won't say who it is, come to us and say, we have this problem. We want to build one of our stores, every time we build one, we want to build it 20% cheaper, and we think we can do that with BIM. So give us uh, some consulting, give us uh, two two-day sessions for four days total to tell us how we can build all of our stores 20% cheaper. And it really was sort of a process of discovery as we worked with this, this large owner. And what we realized was that there are many tools that they use and they came in saying, okay, the, the cost is the nail and the tool is BIM and that's gonna be the hammer. But what we realized was the true way to actually move the needle on getting their price down was to use their power as an owner. All the people who are on the owner side in the federal government, the OSD, Mr. McAndrew, once we decide that we want to work with contractors to unleash the things that they're probably already doing, they're going to do it a lot cheaper and probably a lot better because they're not going to give us those special prices that they give the government uh, who make them do 
unnecessary or onerous overhead, uh, crazy administrative procedures, uh, user directed change orders, and all the other litany of things that we know have happened on, on rescoping efforts on busted bid projects. So at the end of those four days, what we wound up realizing was that if you want to build five grocery stores uh, for the price of four, work with contractors and tell them, I want you to build five grocery stores for the, for the price of four. You're probably not going to get 20% off each individual one when you're looking at the tree instead of the forest. You're looking at the project instead of the program. So specifically on what Major Lorimer's talked about on the PDI, let's use the strength of these mega projects and contract for the, the strength and support of the owners and the, the, the warfighters, as well as the builders who have already a lot of innovative uh, functions that they've probably learned about through Construction Users Roundtable, Construction Industry Institute, Project Production Institute, which I'll, I'll wrap up on and talk about them. And uh, so that, that's setting the scene. And now let's go through just a few of the basic terms that you're going to hear about today. So the traditional method, design, bid, build. Uh, also often called design, bid, build, litigate. Uh, this is a project that I, I'm showing the duality of this project here. It was actually uh, designed by Skidmore, Owings & Merrill in the 1950s uh, by Walter Netsch. Uh, and then it was built and commissioned in September of 1963 uh, as a design, bid, build project. All of the weather stripping was taken out of the project. Uh, it's leaked since it was first constructed. And now, because the Air Force Academy is a nationally historic designated place, uh, they are required to do design, bid, build projects. And so um, this one that's undergoing underway right now at the Air Force Academy was design, bid, build also. I, I think this will be a better one. I don't think it'll be design, bid, build, litigate, but AECOM did uh, a really well-informed design with a reality capture that was accomplished at the Air Force Academy. Uh, with the help from Roger Clark and the 21st CES of the 21st Space Wing out of Peterson. Uh, so they have a design and then that design is handed over and you have a whole nother separate contract with J.E. Dunn who's doing the work. And as you can see, they're very creative uh, by putting an entire en enclosure around the chapel to completely disassemble it and put it back together again the way that it should have been done the first time. But this isn't really probably the norm. Unless you have a National Historic District or something that is highly unique and complex, you probably aren't going to be doing design, bid, build. So remember this one, it was a very unique project, but probably not your preferred way. Uh, the next one, and, and as I go through these, a lot of these projects are not new. And so uh, it could be an innovation if it's if something that's new to you, but uh, it doesn't have to be an innovation for everybody. So you can think like a traditionalist. And so some of these projects I'm gonna show you are not new but they had new things that were done on them. So this project uh, is really interesting. It was done uh, again in, in the probably late 2000s and uh, it was two projects, two contracts and both uh, design build contracts that were bridging contracts. You can have design build like uh, Bechtel does the whole thing where they're the designer and the builder, uh, or you can have a bridge contract where you have a separate designer and a, a builder, but they're bridged together under one contract. This one was unique in that it was two contracts, but for two separate facilities, but with the same builder and the same contractor. This was done by Burns and McDonald. They built the Jigsent facility, and then right next to it, with a slight difference on the side there, you can tell that it's almost the exact same building, they built uh, headquarters CENTCOM at McDill. And the unique thing about this project was uh, they called me in as a consultant when I was getting my PhD at Florida and they said, we're thinking about going with building information modeling on this project. And we don't know if we should require it or not from the designer uh, because they already designed the project once and they would have to completely redo the design again in order to accomplish it with a building information modeling approach. And so uh, we hemmed and hawed around about that, whether or not we should do that. And Eventually, what I wound up doing was, and it was on the back of the military engineer, I'm not sure if they still have the same space reserved all the time or not, but for many years, Burns McDonald would reserve that back page ad on TME and the military engineer. And it said, Burns McDonald, leaders in building information modeling. And so I talked to the powers that be and said, why are we coddling the contractor? Why don't we unleash the contractor and require that they do this project on BIM? They say they're experts in it. Let's see how, how it goes. 
the project was uh, millions of dollars less. They were much more agile and able to respond to changes uh, by moving the interstitial space into raised computer flooring, which was a, a major change from what they did in Jixent. And uh, item after item, Burns McDonald and Clark were able to do this project uh, for far cheaper than they were able to do on Jixent, even though for all intents and purposes, they started over. But that was a design build contract. You have one contract, uh, one entity where you're going to have the designer and, and the builder. The next one, I have multiple items up there. CMAR, so that's construction manager at risk. Uh, could be called design assist, could be called early contractor involvement. And this is something that I is not a DOD project. This was for the major league baseball organizations, the San Diego Padres and the Seattle Mariners. Uh, in Peoria, Arizona, there's a spring training facility where in between the end of one spring training season and the beginning of the other season, they had, had to build multiple baseball fields and facilities. It was designed by Populous. Mortensen was already chosen to be the contractor, the builder, and they partnered with Populous and they were able to work in the constructability uh, and as well as start fast tracking the site work, the construction of the project. It came in on time. And I use this project because there are going to be many times, just like when I was in Camp Bastion with Jason, we knew the day that we were going to be receiving aircraft uh, for receiving staging onward inception, and that was the deadline. So did we have some change orders on that project? Yes, we did. But we met the mission, and we got the, the runway and the 199 football fields of concrete pavements completed in time to accomplish the mission. So if you really, truly partner with the, all the stakeholders in the project, whether it's a, in a case like this where it's the calendar date, spring training season is starting, uh, that can be done and contractors can do it. You just have to be clear and communicative about what your real priorities are. Okay, another unique project. We're back here at the Air Force Academy again. And uh, this is a picture actually from a courtyard project that uh, Sal is probably familiar with from Matrix but I'm focused in on this giant spire. Uh, that project was uh, done under an IDIQ, which is indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. Uh, and there are variants of indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts called job order contracting, uh, special order contracting, single award task order contracting, or multiple award task order contracting. So that was a lot. So maybe we can I can put that in the uh, in the chat there. Uh, but this project uh, was put out for bid many times and it was busting bids left and right. And how the Air Force and the Air Force Civil Engineer Center uh, or the Air Force Center for Engineering and Environment at the time handled this was they said we're going to have to break this project into two things. And so. This project is unique in many ways, not just architecturally, but in that donors paid for the superstructure that you see there, which was an Italian custom one-off project. Uh, and so obviously this was a design bid build, but then the project, mostly the stuff that's underneath there that was relatively familiar, uh, kind of like office space uh, or meeting space, that was done, uh, all of it was done under the Herc contractor and the contractor was ECC, um, but that project was unique in that they were actually able to come in under budget because part of it, the money was donated for the Spire, which most of our DOD projects and Milcom projects aren't going to have donors lining up to pay for our overages. But what was okay was they weren't busting bids because they were able to do this under the HERC IDIQ, which was the same contract that we used in Camp Bastion to do the runway, now you have a shortlisted group of contractors and ECC won this contract uh, to do a project because you have agreed upon price book usually, uh, maybe something from the Gordian group, but, and then you have, you have less administrative overhead of going out and doing the bids and soliciting the project and, and less risk, you're mitigating the risk. And so, uh, this works from everything on carpet replacement IDIQs uh, to paving IDIQs uh, to large mega projects that are even unique like this one. And so IDIQs are a great way to minimize the amount of contracting overhead and to maximize the amount of in-place earned value on the construction site. Okay, another Mortensen project. I highlighted that one, but 
Uh, many times if there is a, an owner who doesn't have the capital but has a facility need, they usually do a public-private partnership. And that can come in the form of toll roads, airport additions, sometimes stadiums are done that way. Uh, but this is a unique one that was done at the University of Washington. And again, not new. This They submitted and won a 2007 American Institute of Architects Technology and Architectural Practice Award for the Benjamin D. Hall Interdisciplinary Research Building. And why they did that was Mortensen uh, came up with the capital and then they designed the project, which is the D. Uh, they optimized it for the space there in order to optimize square footage, much like a lot of GSA projects are always trying to maximize rentable square footage. Uh, as you can see, they really fit it onto the site completely. And then they built it, they operated it, and they maintained it. Uh, the difference between DBOM is you see design, build, operate, maintain. Uh, sometimes it's just called DBOOM because it's design, build, uh, own, operate, maintain. And usually in this type of arrangement, the money is brought uh, to the project and then through tolls or rent, research rent in this case, it's paid back to the contractor. So that's how they get their benefit over time. Once they've gotten their return on investment at some agreed upon time, uh, the, the the asset is usually transferred back over to the original owner who didn't have the capital in the first place. And now they've got a facility, but then also they've got the maintenance at, at some other point. But as you can see, this can be a really powerful function. And with the types of asset management uh, type of work that I know that the Air Force is doing and others, we are the largest real property owner in the world in the Department of Defense. We should use that to our benefit. There are people who want to build on the areas that we have that are that are undeveloped. Uh, and there's there's partnerships there that we can explore. And so, uh, just one second here. I wanna end on one thing, and while I'm showing this slide, I had a poll, and I'm not, I'm not sure if I launched that or not, so I'm gonna start the poll. Uh, there we go, thanks, Kathy. So, I'd like to just see how many of these types of projects uh, people have done. I imagine that some of them probably have almost everybody, but then some probably don't, and so, uh, we looks like we're okay. It's, it's still getting filled out and uh, I'll come back to the results on that in a second. But while I'm talking about that, I wanted to highlight something that we have unique here, uh, that we've seen been, that's been very successful with DOE projects. They're usually mega projects. Uh, I'm partners with a, a gentleman who's on the Stanford accelerator project, which is a large DOE project. And he swears by the project production Institute. Uh, that's an organization that was founded and only has two industry partners, Stanford and Texas A&M. And their main goal is to make sure that projects are uh, productive, predictive, uh, and profitable. And so uh, what they work on is trying to make all the same things that were industrialized into the manufacturing processes, um, trying to help work towards more standardization, modul modularization, for more predictable outcomes and more profitability for companies. And so uh, by applying operation science uh, functions, companies like Chevron and Merck and Microsoft and, and the builders who support them have found a lot of success with the Project Production Institute. Uh, we have a continuing and professional education office. It's led by Professor Tony Moraro, who's got uh, tons of P3 experience. He worked for Hill International, he worked for HNTV, uh, he worked for ECC for a little while. Uh, but he's now here at Texas A&M and he's our continuing professional education office uh, director. And so he has a class that's coming up for planning right now for November of 21, because we're hoping to be in person. Uh, and so that brings the end to my perspective, but I just wanted to end on the poll, which uh, the poll said that only 6% of the audience had done DBOM, 14% had done CMAR or early contractor involvement, and then about 25, 26% on the others, which are usually more common. So not too many CMAR or, thanks Al. Yeah, we'll actually stay on there, Pat. And Kathy, if you can drop the slide for a second, please. Just wanna chat with uh, with Pat for a minute. So um, first off, thanks. I mean, that is a ton of stuff and I know you could do a two or three day seminar on this. And it was a challenge that I handed you saying, hey, how can you hit the, the wave tops for us just for right now? But as you can see, uh, uh, a small number of our audience, we have a good audience, 250, 260, 270 people, something like that are on right now. So not a ton 
are that familiar. Even I circled uh, on your slide, the one about the Seattle Mariners, you you called it three different things. So let's just spend a second on that, you know, as to go back to Mike McAndrew's comment earlier of, of terminology and vernacular and making sure we're all saying the same thing. You've got uh, construction management at risk, design assist, early contractor involvement, all in one line. Can you can you unpack that a little bit and kind of explain what that is um, uh, to the to the layperson? Well, I, I almost added a fourth one, which uh, depending on the business line, uh, Bechtel later will call it integrated engineering, procurement, and construction. So IEPC. But really, it's it's one of those things. Just like Mr. McAndrew said. There, people like to have a lexicon and a vocabulary. Mike Rossi is going to touch on it, but when we can rally around the benefits and not worry as much about what the term is, I think it will be a lot better off. But specifically, I think if you ask Mortensen what they said that was, they said it was CM at risk, and they were brought in early, so there was early contractor involvement, and they, and a paid engagement, worked with populists to make sure that they worked in constructability into the project to meet that really stringent deadline. Okay, uh, I've got some specific questions building in the Q&A. I'm going to hold those to the end because um, other speakers might be talking to the same subjects and then I'll I'll make sure that, uh, Pat, you'll have an opportunity to answer as will others. Um, a couple other comments, though. Um, you know, you made a what I think is a really brilliant statement about using the strength of these large projects. Your example of the grocer in Texas and if anybody who's been in Texas, we all know who that grocer is. Um, without using their three letters that begin with an H and end with a B, um, uh, they uh, they clearly um, move their weight around, so to speak, to get what they wanted. As I think about what the DoD is faced with right now, I'm hoping you know we've got a lot of DoD audience on this. You've got Tyndall major rebuild at four plus billion dollars. You've got China Lake out there at who knows how many billion. You've got everything that's happening in Westpac, which is what Seth kicked off any new major weapon system that's coming in with multiple requirements and facilities. Am I, am I correct in taking what you said and linking it to those as well as the types of things that would really lend themselves well to taking, taking Nelson design bid build and move them aside and bringing in a little more Nirvana. Yes. That, that's what I would say is that, uh, Charlie Cool might feel good when he listens to Nelson, but the rest of us feel a lot better when we achieve Nirvana. So that, that is what we need to do. We need to not be even more heavy handed than we already are in some regards. We need to figure out, are we filling out the TPS reports? Do we really need to fill out those TPS reports? Or are we, are we uh, helping unleash the contractors? And so that's what I would say is let them do what they're best at and, uh, have them demonstrate their past success, uh, but then be a better partner. I, I, I think that I, the thing I alluded to, and I know we've talked about Sal, is that you have the price that you would do that for your developer at Hanover or some other company, uh, and then you have the DOD price because you know there's going to be a lot more rigmarole or, or insert other uh, less PG uh, words there. So um, that, just like that Burns McDonald project, that was, it was, we hemmed and hawed, and then, I mean, we finally said, okay, we're going to just ask them to do what they're advertising that they're the best at. So it's it's kind of ludicrous. Well, I think we've reached our own nirvana because we had an office space reference. So if you can get an office space reference uh, in a webinar, then you're doing extremely well. I think that's going to be, oh, I got to see if Mike McCandle will agree. The tagline for Milcon Delivery is going to be Nix the TPS report. We'll see if we can we can get up that. So, all right, Pat, uh, sure. stay around. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. Mike's, Mike's back. What'd you say, Mike? Yes, anything. I mean, I, I, I'm, I like being, I like being a rule breaker, right? Okay. And so I, I will enjoy talking to the Hill, and I want to talk to my contracting guys more. If we can do things to, to get rid of the onerous nonsense, um, I want them to prove to us that we need those rules rather than the other way around. So. All right, I love it. All right, um, Mike. Thanks, uh, Pat. Uh, don't go anywhere. We've got some questions for you here in a little bit. So, but thanks for that segment. All right, so let's uh, let's get back on our program, switching gears. Uh, next up uh, is going to be uh, our second mic uh, of our presentation, Mike Rossi. Uh, we have three mics today, uh, by the way, Mike McAndrew, Mike Rossi, Mike Casas. Uh, we we had four, but we had to mix that mic and bring in Pat just so we didn't have only Mike speakers. So um, Mike Rossi has an incredible resume uh, and brings in a wealth of knowledge, and he's got some great 
examples of, hey, this stuff's real. I did it. And uh, we're going to we're going to hear some of that. So, uh, Mike, off to you. Mike, Great. Thanks, Sal. All right. Aloha and uh, mahalo for letting me uh, speak today here for the Honolulu Post. I missed my time on the island there and I've never got island fever, not for a moment of it. Um, so uh, not to say too much about um, myself, I'll take Pat's lead here. Um, I guess my portion of this is to say that um, there was a, a time when I was in when we were really trying to innovate and trying to get at some things. Um, and then when I got out of the Army, I tried to leverage a little bit of that to help agencies continue to try to innovate in the project delivery piece and are still, you know, in and out of that and, and trying to do that. So we're going to we're going to talk about uh, as as Mike was talking about OSD, maybe looking to, to push Congress and push people to try um, to try innovation and try to leverage industry. We'll see kind of, you know, kind of a, in a macro sense, a case study of a of a, of a district and an agency that did it and kind of where it went and, and where we are today with it. Um, so this is not a, a, a press to do uh, ECI or SEMA risk. It's just a, a, you know, an explanation of kind of how we got there. So my first slide, I'll, I'll get, uh, I'll talk to you about, um, I'm trying to put my notes up here. So years ago, um, my USACE counsel asked me in his Socratic way when I was a district commander, he said, Colonel, what's the difference between the private sector and the federal government. You know, I had no idea what he was getting at. I tried to game it. And he said, let me make it simple for you. In the private sector, you can basically do anything that's not prohibited by law. In other words, as long as it, you don't violate the, you know, thou shalt not, you know, you, 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 it's open to you. You, could, you, know, you can do, you know, make these uh, uh, movies. You can, you know, produce uh, you know, salmon, farm salmon, whatever you want to do, as long as it's not strictly prohibited, you it's open, the world is open to you. It says, in contrary to that, in the government, you can only do what's proscribed by law. In other words, there has to be a thou shalt. And we all know that is we need an authorization and appropriation from Congress. And I would just tell you that you talk about an initiative killer. That's probably one right there, you know, that you, you're only able to do what you're basically prescribed and allowed to do. Um, except sometimes there's a little bit of light at the end of the bureaucratic tunnel. So I'm showing you this quote right out of the first section, the first page of the FAR, which is really, you know, all the, the parts of, uh, of FAR 1.102 are all pretty interesting just to kind of read and get a perspective, not like I do that for my bedtime reading. But in trying to get something moved forward in the bureaucracy years ago, I thought this was particularly helpful. And I'll just read it to you for a second. It said, if a policy or procedure or a particular strategy or practice is in the best interest of the government and is not specifically addressed in the FAR, nor prohibited by law, government members of the team should not assume that it is prohibited. Rather, in the, ab in the absence of direction, should be interpreted as permitting the team to innovate and use sound business judgment that is otherwise consistent with the law and within the limits of our authority. So I think, you know, we looked at that uh, years ago, uh, and we'll talk about kind of what we we're trying to get at. We thought this was our get out of jail free card. You know, this was our okay. The chief at the time, uh, General Flowers, then succeeded then by um, by General Strzok. They had this famous thing called a just do it card, and they said if you had the legal authority and if it was good for your customer, you as a colonel or district commander, um, you know, you've got you've already got my permission. You've got, you know, this is your permission slip. And, you know, when I got called on the carpet for trying this stuff, you know, I, I whipped out my permission slip and they said, well, what, what, what are you thinking about this stuff? I said, well, I got legal counsel, I got contracting and we got a client that thinks this is great. So we just did it and, you know, and it, it, it worked out, you know, but, uh, but I think that this, if, um, if you're an agency leader, you're in the government and you get pushback or the old excuse against, you know, aggressive um, project delivery innovation, um, because they say it's not in the FAR, you can say, well, you know, it, it might be, <laughs> it is in the FAR and, you know, because it's not, it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be specifically in the FAR to allow me to, to try some stuff. All right, let me go to the next slide for, for the team here. Okay. So let's get to terms of reference. Um, the, um, 
what was going on back in the 2004 with my predecessor, Don Curtis, in the Kansas City District and the great civilians that were working there as they started to germinate this idea was private, the private sector, um, you know, uses three things, you know, three basic project delivery methods, you know, the basic building blocks, design, bid, build, design, build, and, and construction manager, construction management at risk. And why are we only using two of them? Why are we only doing design, bid, build, and design, bid, and design, build? Um, and, you know, I bring this primer up. It's about a three-page read. It's been updated a few times since 2004. The latest update is, is 2016. It's only about three pages, but it talks about that there's a lot of variations off these three, but these, these two agencies, the AGC and, um, and AIA, both agreed to say, let's just define the terms for, for industry and how you in project delivery. And they have some basic characteristics which differentiate them, and everything else is an extrapolation because you could have, um, you know, it either talks about, um, you know, how you award it or how you compensate at the end of it. It could be design, build, award fee. It could be fixed price, fixed price. You know, whatever it is, there's a there's a bunch of different extrapolations, but but these are kind of the three building blocks of project delivery, um, you know, by these agencies. So in design, bid, build, you have three players. You got the owner, you got the designer, and you got the builder. And there are two contracts that define the relationships between these two. There's an, obviously there's a contract between the owner and the designer and the owner and the, cons the constructor. Um, and then the final, con the contractor or the constructor is usually based upon the lowest responsible bid or the total contract price. Now there's, there's variations on that, but generally speaking in the design, bid, build world, since you have a complete set of plans and specs, um, you know, you generally speaking, the owner is going to rely on the market to, to determine the best value to the owner for that particular case. So it's basically a bid climate that works out. In design, in design build, you know, the, there's many differences, but the, the primary difference is there's only one contract. There's only a relationship between the owner and the design build entity. And, and they have a relationship and they decide how, you know, they're going to compete it, how they're going to compensate later on. Like I said, whether it's design, build, um, um, what do I want to say? It's, it's design, build, cost reimbursable, design, build, fixed price award fee. There's a lot of different extrapolations off it, but, it, you know, it's basically defined by the fact that there's one contractual relationship between the stakeholders. Um, and you know, there's a, there's other things too. The nice thing about design build is unlike design bid build, you can overlap uh, the design phase and the construction phase. So you can, you know, you can fast track. Um, and a lot of times, you know, this is, you know, given the right kind of risks amongst, you know, the parties, this becomes the best piece. And I'm going to come back to the, what's the key to acquisition strategy risk piece here in a second. For a construction manager at risk, it's, a little bit like for construction management at risk, it's it's a lot like design bid building that there are two contractual relationships between the stakeholders. There's there's a, again there's a contract between the owner and the designer, and there's a contract between the owner and the construction manager at risk. And like design build, though, you can have overlapping phases. In other words, you can begin construction during the build phase, and you can take advantage of the constr the constructor or the CM at risk in this particular case, um, informing the design as it progresses. And that's a, that we always thought was a very big, you know, a very big benefit to this particular piece. And then generally speaking, this isn't selected. You don't procure this based upon a bid climate or a low price, technically acceptable kind of um, bid structure. You, you select on a best value trade off and you put a heck of a lot of stake in the technical factors versus the price factor. And you're just really trying to bring, as we coach people up when they try to do this, you're really trying to pick the best teammate. Um, and the compensation structure of the contract will dictate the fact that you get a fair price and you work that out and try to mitigate your risks through that. Um, and you see but back at the top, I say, what's the key to acquisition strategy? And, and I, I would say it's the proper allocation of risk for the amongst the parties for the objective of the project you want to put in there, that you're not throwing or unfairly lever uh, putting too much risk upon the constructor or the designer or the owner uh, in, the, in the relationship between the three 
uh, you know, given what you know about the project and, and the uh, constraints and kind of the, the forces that are acting upon the end state of the project. And we're going to talk some lessons learned here. And when we get to the end of my brief, we'll kind of talk about a, you know, my kind of feeling about a rule of thumb for when you use what and what kind of risk you're willing to take. And, and we'll get to that piece later on. All right. So I'm going to get to the next slide. Should have somebody flipping for me because it takes me a while to settle my mouse here. Okay. So this will talk about um, one back. Okay. Good grief. There we go. So I, I know it's called early contractor involvement. I know when you say tried to, you know, we had the kind of uh, arguments over, you know, what to do and what to call it. We had, they had to label it something else. We're, I was always a proponent for calling it what industry calls it. Cause I know for a fact I was there. We modeled it after CM at risk and all we did truthfully was we tortured the FAR to get to the you know, to get to the proper allocations of risk so that we could find a way to create the relationships in the private sector CM at risk contract. And we did that using the, Fixed price incentive successive targets FAR clause. Probably it absolutely when it was put in the FAR was not envisioned that it was there to build, you know, to deliver facility. It was probably there to deliver, you know, bullets or subs or tanks or something, you know, airplanes or something different. It wasn't um, it wasn't thought of, I guess, envisioned to do a facility, but there it was. It was a way we can create the risk and rewards we needed in order to both procure, right? Get the procurement out and award a contract and get the thing going and also operate, you know, in other words, deliver the project. So at BOD, you had a project that, you know, that, that had a high probability of, of being on schedule and on budget. So that's what we did. It, it is definitely modeled after ECI. Uh, first time, you know, when Kansas City, we called it CM at risk. And then the North Atlantic Division called it IDBB. And finally, USACE put it all under one umbrella and said, you know something, we're going to call it early contractor involvement. And the confusion continues to still reign today. Um, I'm going to talk about some projects, so we won't get more into that. Uh, the AE selection, as I told you, is done by normal proced pro procedures. In other words, the Brooks Act, you know, you select on qualifications and then you negotiate price later because you have a separate contractor. And in one particular case, um, you know, we did the house in, in we did the design in house in the Kansas City district. And I truly, that was a fantastic experience. We learned a lot about that. And it actually made, I will submit to you, it made the district and its Milcon design elements, um, you know, just phenomenally better and uh, through the, you know, through the other things they were doing for the BRAC process at the time. And we'll talk about one of the projects there and how that went. Um, I talked about the construction contract or the CM, you know, being a best value source selection, uh, you know, typical, you know, uh, you know, through the typical means of the FAR. Fastest of the fast track, I'll show you a project. You can, you can make things go fast. You can overlap design and construction um, almost from, from the onset if you kind of got your act together and procure it, right? If the project demands it and if it's the wise thing for the ultimate goal of the project. Um, you know, first thing you always hear when you brief a new agency, say, you know, it's, even within you say you go to a new district, but you go to a, uh, you know, the VA or the G, you know, just name the government agency, and you and you're talking to them about uh, construction management at risk, and you're saying, well, you can you you can get to it by the fixed price incentive successive targets clause, and you create a contract, and you'll always hear it's not legal or it's not in the FAR, and I'll just tell you all that is old news. Um, uh, ECI using the fixed price incentive successive targets clause has been the pinata that council and contracting hit with sticks for about two years while Kansas City was asking for forgiveness for Darren to try this. And it survived. And it it survived um, the vetting and it avoided becoming what I always love to say, you know, what's a camel? It's a it's a horse by dis by committee. And so this, you know, turned into a committee operation and it's still survived fairly well and still works. Although I'll tell you the earlier projects seemed easier because we weren't cluttered with uh, a lot of thou shalt and thou shalt not. And we, we all talk about most of the concern when you're talking to an agency, when you're talking to somebody new, like um, um, say, uh, you know, a federal agency is, is, is the procurement going to work? How are we going to procure it? Is it going to get protested? How do we get this thing off the mark? And there's little thought taught, a little bit of little thought given to how are we going to execute this thing once the award is, is given? Is it, is it, can we prosecute this to a successful, you know, time and budget that we're looking for? And, 
And I, you know, I, I, I listened to Mike at the beginning of this thing. That's, you know, that to me is where this thing always gets lost. A lot of headquarters and a lot of agencies are so fixated on making the award and making the award on time and obligating the dollars and everything else that little thought is given, you know, to, you know, was this project a success? Is it a success because it was awarded on time or is it a success because it was given over to the, to the uh, end state end user on time and, and within budget? And so, you know, if you look at it from that piece, you got to always pick the, to me, the project delivery method that's going to get you to the end, not the one that's going to just get you an award. Next slide. Let's go to um, let's go to the projects. Okay, so I'm gonna just talk about a few of these. If it's in green, I had my hand in it either in either in procurement, in contract award or construction, or even sometimes the autopsy or the after action review. You know, in some cases, all of that as we went through. So I just want to talk about a couple of them because we learned a few lessons on a few of these things. And again, this is not to pitch ECI or CM at risk. It's just to say that I'm, I'm of the age now where I know empirically that, you know, the first time I try anything, I'm never perfect. I'm always going to stink it at the first day, whether it's, you know, if I tried it for the first time and I chalk it up to learning and I get better at it as I go along or get, or get good at it if I do it enough times. Um, the Lewis and Clark Center, the Commander General Staff College of Fort Leavenworth was, was the first. That's the one we did in 2004. The, and it was uh, it actually was on time and on budget. Um, I'd say it was the easiest one to do because even though it was the first, it wasn't burdened with a lot of, you know, thou shouts and thou shalt nots and what are you doing and and can you do this? I mean, we just, we uh, we had a great contractor. Uh, J.E. Dunn was the contractor. I know Pat showed one of the projects they did and they they knew this was the first. They wanted this to succeed and we as the district wanted this to succeed. So we worked together, truly partnered to make sure that we, figured stuff out. And one of the first things J.E. Dunn came in and did, and this was just as I was arriving at the district, is they they came in and said, uh, and they got brought in at about 35% design. And they said, you know, your building's backwards. You know, it's facing the, it's facing the pond. Uh, you know, the entrance is facing the pond and we're going to have to do a ton of site work and, uh, and soil stabilization. You know, it needs to be flipped. It needs to be facing the opposite direction. The back end of the college needs to be facing the pond and the entrance needs to be the other direction. And we got to look and he said, you know something, you're right. And the cost savings or the uh, cost over overrun avoidance, I should say, was such that we just backed it up. We went back to, you know, five or 10% in the design phase, flipped the college around and, and did it based upon, you know, based upon their input. And what I would say is kind of come into the game a little late. And how it did. So the lesson learned from this one was was bring the contractor, bring the construction manager on as early as you can, because that's when your biggest um, impact happens. And I know Bechtel and uh, and Mike uh, Costa is going to speak to that. You know, as, as he talks you through his curves, and it's so it's you just can't say that enough of how important it is. If you're going to do any kind of integrated project delivery where you have the constructor come in and, and help with the design and what, whether it's design build or CM at risk, you've got to, you've got to get the contractor in the constructor in early and have a vote and, and, a, and a say and impact early. The next one I want to talk about is Tuttle Creek seismic upgrade. And uh, Alberici was the constructor here. This had a ceiling of about $200 million. Um, and the base contract was a big base contract that has included some. We had no way. We, we didn't exactly know how we we're going to solve this thing, how we're going to keep this dam from not flooding in a seismic event downtown Manhattan, Kansas. And so we had in the base contract that we wanted Alberici to, to practice jet grouting and not practice it, but demonstrate jet grouting and see if that could stabilize it. And, and as we went through that, that contract, um, we learned a lot about jet grouting, but it also allowed the modeling of the seismic event to, to progress to the point where we didn't have to do jet grouting and we were able to to basically change the scope of the contract not a change order where we had a fixed price but kind of negotiate a change order that was and to do the work and achieve the goals of the project for 30 million dollars less than what we had programmed that we thought it was going to take us to do this so the lesson learned here was that having the con the constructor on board while you're trying to figure out a complex technical solution and you're trying to develop it was was best on a number of levels. That was technical level, on a contractual level, on a cost level, on a risk level. So that was the lesson learned on that one. And the the, uh, the big red one headquarters uh, was on time and on budget, extremely fast track, 22 months from RFP to 
the ribbon cutting. 22 months. What happened was the Big Red One division had left Germany, went to Iraq, and was coming back to Fort Riley, Kansas as part of realignment and closure, you know, 22 months later. So like the uh, spring training facility that Pat talked about, you know, we had a hard date. This is the one Mortensen was the, was the CM on this one. And what I had done in the district was we decided to design this one in-house instead of putting it out Brooksack and have a designer. And what we did was I cleared some space, or not, I shouldn't say, I, we, the district, we cleared space um, in engineering, a um, couple of cubes to work so shoulder to shoulder. And we kind of had just in time advice, depending on what discipline we were working through to help us through structural steel, siding, you know, uh, skin, everything else that went into this building. And um, man, did they come up with some, you know, great salute, you know, uh, Morrison really helped us with some great solutions, made my engineers better. And they were, you know, everything from we should be using moment connections on the on the structural steel as opposed to simple connections that we're thinking about. We're going to use tilt up um, concrete walls as opposed to uh, you know what we were thinking of before. And and all of this, um, all of this, you know, I saw the benefit firsthand in the in, in the design from having the contractor early on. And we actually cut the ribbon to a fully functional, you know, Star Wars esque division headquarters. Um, you know, right on time and, and when, when the division redeployed. So, you know, enumerate, innumerable time and cost savings initiatives brought on by them and, and brought them on actually pre-designed charrette. That's how early we brought them on. So another case to bring, to get that constructor on early in the project. Um, I'll just say that while the NGA East and the uh, Fort Belvoir Hospital were IDBB, that was the North Atlantic Division's version of CM at Risk, kind of, you know, their adjustment to what they saw Kansas City doing prior to everybody buttoning it up in one ECI kind of thing. Even though we had two districts on the same particular piece of land doing it, it'll go to show you that they both approached the two jobs in a different way. Um, and, uh, you know, Turner, you know, a JV with Turner as, uh, as the bigger of the, of the JV did the Belvoir Hospital, Clark with, as the bigger of the JV that they were working with, um, had the Mark, had the, uh, not the Mark Center, the um, NGA East. And, and they had a, both had a completely different experience given the, the client, the district. Um, I will tell you the lesson learned from that because I was in charge of the Belvoir Integration Office. So I had both those working under me to try to get this thing, this thing through even. Um, and, you know, I watched uh, what I learned there is, is that the, the owner, in, in this case, the, the, um, the MedCom folks plus you say for the health hospital or the NGA group with the, um, with the NGA East and in and, and the Baltimore district, you know, the owner needs to be engaged. The owner needs to, for lack of a better term, man up. It's, you know, we're shifting risk in these particular case, kind of the owner's taking on a little bit more risk in CM at risk because he's trying, he doesn't have a fixed price. He's going to, or, you know, he's going to at the beginning and this, this thing's progressing and he's not quite sure where it might end. You've got to be engaged. You've got to have the right staff and the right people on the job to, be able to keep up with the myriad of decisions and challenges that are getting solved by the design entity and by the construction manager as, as this thing progresses, especially if you're overlapping design and construction and you're on kind of a fast track. You've got to man up. You've got to have the staff. And I don't mean it's got to be, everybody's got to be a government employee. Sometimes you have to leverage your staff by, by augmenting with contractors or specialty, but you've got to keep up and you've got to have a mechanism to, um, and I think I may talk this about this in lessons learned, but you got to have a mechanism to solve problems. Um, the last are these five humongous civil works projects post Katrina to basically provide flood protection to New Orleans. Um, the biggest lesson here was the, the hurricane protection office and the New Orleans district had no idea. They couldn't figure out the technical solutions on the tight time track they had. I'm talking site access, ever fluctuating steel prices. Um, uh, you, you know, the sheet piles, how they were going to work, the levy design, they had a, they had, you know, dozens to hundreds of technical issues, which they didn't have a solution for. So they actually had to, you know, really depend on industry to say, how, how are we going to do this? Um, they brought them in, um, you know, I was in the middle of this now, not in the government anymore, but helping the government as a private sector. And I used to go crazy on the on the minutiae and the inside baseball of how each of these contracts is running 
and the fact that I thought we could save some more money here and there. And, but that was the, that was, as Pat was saying, that was the tree. That was the tree of each particular project in the forest. The core had budgeted and assumed that, that this program of these mega projects was going to be, you know, because they didn't know how they were going to solve it. They had larded it up with a tremendous amount of money. And this thing, this actual program came in a lot less expensive to the taxpayer and to the core, you know, to the core and the partners because the civil works projects that the core had, then, then the core had programmed because industry helped the core solve these technical problems and these buildability and constructability problems. Um, and I don't know if you all remember back from 2000 and, um, 10 or so the picture on uh, the cover of ENR that had, you know, at sunset, you know, probably a hundred cranes, you know, sitting down there at uh, LPV 14802. Um, and you looked at the Seabrook, Seabrook sector gates where they needed uh, on the IHNC where they needed to use coffer dams and Albrici came up with a unique coffer dam solution in order to kind of construct the work. And this was all delivered because it had a hard goal, you know, on the, these, these projects on time and, you know, sometimes not as efficiently as they could be, but they were, that was the predominant governing issue at that point in time is get it done on time and programmatically on budget. Um, uh, Fort Irwin Community Hospital, I wasn't a part of, so I'm not going to talk to it. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So the VA tried this. As most agencies, they gave it their own name, Integrated Design Construct, okay, is what they call it. It's still CM at risk using the fixed price incentive successive targets, um, successive targets clause. Um, so not the greatest of experiences with this. Um, and you know, some of their problems were the same as, as USACE's problems. The challenge, um, well, let me just try to see, see how I can say this the best way. Okay, so not unlike USACE, the problems came, I think, when the stakeholders tried to run the CMRS contract or IDC in this case, and they tried to turn it into something that they were more familiar with. In other words, a lump sum fixed price single award task order contract or a cost reimbursable contract prior to negotiation prior to negotiating the firm fixed price. In other words, they didn't really operate it and prosecute it like a CM at risk contract or an ECI contract. They tried to make it something they were familiar with and that just became frustrated. The other lesson learned, and that was the same, you know, the same lesson from Belvoir and the NGA and the MB in the New Orleans work was that the owner needs to resource this thing to keep up. Um, and all of those, I think the NGA probably did the best of it of those ones I just mentioned, but but the VA isn't structured that way. The VA, VA CFM isn't structured that way. They're very, they're not, they don't, they don't do things highly leveraged or put a bunch of people on the ground. And, and you do when it's, when the, I tell you, when the project starts going sideways, you do, you st everybody gets interested, you know, and then you start manning up. But, but these, this is kind of a, this is kind of a full contact procurement method, CM at risk, meaning the owner's got to be, you know, got to be very involved. And I'll just say that, that you know that that case is was a lesson learned, um, you know by that that boy we really need to put the people there that can keep up with the where the design's going and the and the construction going and to, and to the VA to to make it right for the VA I don't think that they're the only ones that were trying to turn this into something they understood better I'd say the designers the design entities in this case and perhaps even though the both contractors on both these uh, the bigger hospitals uh, had CM at risk experience that you know, for whatever reasons that everybody starts making this kind of, you know, you know, try to turn it into something, it, you know, uh, it, it's not, and, you know, just end up wrestling through it. But, but to be fair, hospitals are damn hard. They're just hard. Um, and besides the technical poise, cause that's not really the hardest part is that for federal hospitals, there's multi owners, not one owner. All right, USACE may be the delivery agent for the owner, or the or CFM may be the delivery agent for the owner on the VA side. But the truth is, the core's got to deal with MedCom and and whatever branch that hospital has to be on, and that's the ultimate end user. And sometimes what they want might be at odds with what you know what needs to be you know what the, they can't speak with one voice. I'll just say it that way. And the same thing with the VA. The the CFM delivers the project or or did. And, but, you know, the local medical facility staff, uh, you know, has a big say in kind of what the end state's supposed to look like. And sometimes budget and, uh, and schedule may, you know, come at odds with kind of what the wish list is. And they have to just sort through that. Um, it, it, 
that's a that's a function of what you know that delivering hospitals like they're always hard um uh, one lesson learned from this from all of these i'll tell you is that um in a cm at risk scenario i think the stakeholders all have to truly buy into partnering um i don't mean just sign a charter after two days of socializing i mean commit the resources the people both in quality and quantity put your you know the best people have to be on th these kind of contracts and, and enough of them that i'm saying that from the owner side to ensure the project succeeds and then are they going to agree and stick to some form of disciplined problem solving and dispute resolution rigor that says look we're not going to let something get stale here it's going to be it's going to go up the chain so within two weeks we're moving off dead center and the and the leads or the principles of the on the ownership side and the architect side and the and the constructor side if that if those presidents of those firms or those heads of those agencies have to meet you know once a month to say what's left over and let's decide how to solve it then they do it or else or else momentum builds towards slowing the project down all right let me see one more here um i apologize to y'all but pat told me i could talk long <laughs> as i needed to <laughs> all right so here, here it goes. Uh, when to use CM at risk versus design bid build or design build. If these are the three big tools in the box, you know what what have I observed or learned over the days on on what might be, you know what might be the right tool for what you've got. Okay, so what's important to you, the owner, and where does the risk lie? So we talked about it before the art is picking the right project delivery method to properly align the risk. The big factors are time, budget, quality, and owner's expectations. So a couple of uh, couple of illustrative examples. Prior to design start, ask yourself, you know, if the owner doesn't necessarily know precisely what he wants, okay, sometimes he knows the end state, but not how to engineer it or solve it. He isn't necessarily and he isn't necessarily constrained by schedule. And he's most interested in paying the least for what he gets. In other words, budget or, or cost is super important to him. Um, I'd offer you that design bid build may be the best delivery method for the project. You know, he can figure out exactly what he wants through the design process and have a good understanding of the probability of cost at the end of that design before committing to construction. So as long as the design reflects exactly what he wants, it's relatively free of errors, omissions, and ambiguity, and it's robust enough for a high level of confidence in his government estimate, the open market competition, the construction, the construction marketplace should give the owner the best price. So Design, bid, build. If you kind of don't know what you want at the beginning, I mean, you know what you want in the end, but you really don't know precisely what it is. And cost is super important, less so than schedule. You probably go to design, bid, build, and everybody's been doing that for years and should know how to do it. So let's say the owner knows what he wants, or at least the minimum requirements of what he'll accept. He may not know or be interested in how the end state's achieved, particularly as far as the engineering goes. Schedule is an important constraint as either the project needs to be fully obligated. In other words, we need to award construction in this year. So I got to, you know, it might be a funding issue or it might just be a when I need it thing. Um, and, and he might, and, that, and it might benefit from overlapping design and construction phases is the best way to alleviate the risks of being late. In, 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 you know, in summary, getting what he wants in a macro requirements based kind of way when he needs it is the most important or at least more important than owning the design and its many decisions. Here I'd offer the design build may be the best delivery method. So long as the owner doesn't change his mind with respect to requirements, threshold, scope, and all that other stuff along the way, he'll get the, he'll get the fastest best value project, you know, if that's the case. Um, but you've got to be willing to let go uh, in that particular case and, and, you know, say what you want, but not be too particular about, you know, if, if it comes back coming to you a little bit different way, we all, we all, know this the the educated crowd i'm speaking to i don't need to dive too much into that so lastly let's talk about cm risk if the owner doesn't know precisely what he wants he may know the end state but not how to solve it i talked about new orleans hospital i talked about Tuttle creek uh, not new orleans hospital new orleans um flood control projects i talked post katrina i talked about the Tuttle creek dam if he can't afford if he and he doesn't really know how to solve it or how it wants to look in the end, and he's on a tight, hard schedule for BOD, and he can't afford to be late. It might be a legality, like in BRAC, or it might be politically, or whatever the reasons, um, operationally. Um, 
but schedule is super important. You know, cost is always important, but not so more than schedule or having control over the final design and the, ult- and the ultimate facility structure's quality. So, you know, you've got to have control of the design because you, you, you're not going to just take, you know, I don't want to say anything, but you, you, you're going to be very prescriptive about what you want. Um, in this particular case, I'd say ECI or SEMA risk is the best delivery thing because the owner can still overlap design and construction. He still owns the design and the designer's got the advice and the input of the construction manager to solve all the engineering challenges. Um, and as it progresses, he can walk the quality into his budget. Uh, it, that's kind of an inartful way to say it, but that's kind of what goes on there. So um, let me see if I got a couple more notes. I want to make sure I hit. Got to scroll down on my notes here. Oh, well, I don't. So uh, keys to success. We always talked about bringing the, con- I already talked about bringing the contractor on earlier. Keep it simple. Don't find convoluted. I'm talking after award. Don't find convoluted ways to make this contract harder than it is. Um, in other words, turn it into a cost reimbursable contract. You have to do EC- EVMS. It's required. Um, it's a good thing. Good, good companies, the kind of companies you want to select the kind of companies you want to do CM at risk projects, EVMS is not a bridge too far from EVMS is, is if it's not explicitly by the ANSI EIA standard 748, it's it's really by in principle how they deliver projects. I'm sure Bechtel's gonna you know tell you how they've succeeded by using these same exact principles to deliver, you know, tremendously complex projects on time for a, a diverse amount of uh, client. Um, and the last thing I'll say is. Alternative project delivery isn't dead yet in the federal universe of things. That that it's still it's just dormant. Um, I'm thinking about uh, I get pings every once in a while. Um, I'm thinking of there's a young contracting officer in the Tulsa district. He recently finished his master's thesis on ECI and progressive design build. His name's Brian Hutchison. So he's he's thought about this hard. He did a ton of research. Uh, I got was lucky enough to be a part of that in which he gave me an interview. I kind of looked at his paper. The regional contracting chief for the South Pacific Division, Jim Bartha, has been and remains a fan of CM at Risk. He's authored a case study with Dr. James Rich from USACE a few years back called Innovations in Construction by USACE. You know, sooner or later, these intrepid few will hopefully move that agency and, and maybe you've got a few in your own agency forward to dare to innovate. And again, you got to, there's a risk in innovation. Um, but you can mitigate that risk by, by, by having thoughtful people help you through it by, by learn, you know, learning from the backs of others. Um, it really is, um, you know, I, I challenge you to do that. All right. I'm getting the hook there, Sal. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mike, thanks a lot. Um, a lot of content as, as, as we knew it was going to be, um, you know, you, you made a couple of comments. I want to revisit here real quick. You made that, uh, fantastic, um, comment about how buy-in truly are going to have to buy into a partnering construct. I'm going to use another word of trust. Um, I did not hear that come up, but I think that's imperative as you look at some of these different uh, delivery methods. Um, There's a couple of great comments I just want to shed a little light on. Jim Wink made the comment of a culture of compliance versus a culture of excellence. I think it's a great way of uh, kind of summarizing some of the challenge that exists within uh, within uh, you know some of our partners uh, today, and Eric Turner reminded me of a important uh, point that we learned. Uh, uh, the Matrix and MS2 team have been working with OSD on this whole Milcom reform initiative for some time, and we sat and we talked to the bigs of the bigs. You know, we talked to Bechtel and, and Gil Bain and and uh, Whiting Turner and Kiewit and, and and a bunch of folks, and we got some great insight early in the process on our core discovery. And one of the comments that was made, it was a very simple quote was, the government focuses on award while the private sector focuses on delivery. Um, uh, and that that is such a big uh, rock that it, that needs to be moved as we work our way through this process. So anyway, uh, more to come, Mike. We'll come back to you in the Q&A. Uh, a couple of administrative comments here real quick before we go to Mike um, Costas. Um, uh, I know uh, two and a half hours is a long time. We don't have a program break. So again, for those of you who need to step away for a second, please do. Uh, this is in fact being recorded. So if you missed a segment, you can come back and watch it. Uh, and more specifically, some folks have asked, can they share this with others? There's others that they wanna have uh, hear this message 
absolutely. Um, I don't know how to get the recording. Kathy Hoff can let us know in the chat bar how that works. And also some folks have indicated they're gonna have to drop before this is done. Um, I wanna point out that in the handouts tab, uh, two important documents. One is the actual presentation itself in PDF format that you can download. But also there's a survey there um, that I will talk to at the end of the presentation, but if you got to go before then, you won't hear it. Um, we are going to continue this discussion in the form of a work group or maybe work groups um, over the next uh, eight weeks or so leading up to JETC with some delivery in mind. So if you've got a drop um, and you think you might be interested in being part of a work group, take a look at that um, alternative delivery method survey. Uh, we think we're going to have more volunteers than we can um, legitimately have as part of this thing. So we're going to have to ensure that we have a great representation of our overall society uh, on that work group. And that's going to be done through the through the survey monkey. Okay, uh, Mike, that did not count as any of your time. Uh, you still have your full 30 minutes. So All right. we look forward to uh, hearing how Bechdel has done some of the stuff for other agencies. And um, I'll be back when you're done. All right. So just a quick comms check. Can you guys hear me? All right, good. Contact. Yeah, you're loud and clear, Mike. We got you. Okay. All right, let's let's uh, let's flip over to the next slide. And you know, I, I I'm really kind of humbled to have um, uh, such a great team of people, Sal, working uh, with you on this and and being able to take this message to uh, to the the vast folks out there that are really focused on taking you know our military journey and support to the next level. You know, I always tell our teams that you know this is all about the work that we do. Uh, to support the warfighter and, you know, the peer nation threats that we're facing every day justify um, probably the, the unique solutions that we could all uh, offer. We've got great contractors on the line and, and great acquisition officials and, and, and clients. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the things that we do. And uh, we just jump to the next slide. I, I, I really want to amplify um, what Bechtel is all about and, uh, and how the enterprise supports uh, my business line. I, I run the defa defense and space business line. I got a great group of people that work with me. The customers are fantastic. And we continue to grow nicely, but I, I really believe that we've done it just by uh, building strong partnerships uh, with the client. And, uh, and quite frankly, what it what's easy for us uh, to, to do and the way we execute our work is that we have four global business units by which uh, we have an opportunity to leverage skill sets, and um, equipment, labor, uh, qualifications of our people, engineers, our, our you know the subcontract community. We got a full set of, of partners across all of these global business units based on whatever the opportunity is. Uh, I'm afforded uh, the uh, the ability to go and, and leverage somebody, let's say from the oil and gas business that has uh, marine engineering expertise, or uh, folks from the infrastructure organization that's built uh, airports all around the world. And so uh, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate in, in uh, having uh, these capabilities wherever they may be. They may not necessarily be resident to the business line, uh, but they can certainly be uh, captured from other areas with, within the business. Um, on the next slide, um, the Defense and Space Organization, if, if you really look at, at who we are and what we do, uh, we do um, have customers within the DOD, but we also have NASA customers. And uh, customers with um, within the UK, um, Australia, and, and Saudi Arabia. So we're we're a fairly balanced organization around uh, both domestic and and uh, uh, international uh, opportunities. Uh, I would say that our, our business really focuses on first of a kind, kind of high risk design and construction um, opportunities. Uh, we have uh, a robust and qualified supply chain uh, that we rely heavily on. We've got great bonding capacity. I know it's a tough uh, time for a lot of companies in the middle of the pandemic, um, but uh, for the longest time, Bechtel is a private company that we've, we've managed to, to, to be debt-free and at the same time have the right to ratings within the banking institutions to ensure that we get uh, uh, bonded appropriately. Our, our people have qualifications in nuclear, um, you know, a DOD, DMIL, uh, foreign military sales, uh, leveraging a lot of local content. And then much like with uh, the work that we do across the global business units, I also can tap into our uh, nuclear security and uh, operational organization, 
our nuclear power group and and our environmental organization. And uh, so these people are they and they tend to be very high tech focused, nuclear experience, NQA one uh, qualifications, and uh, really tough jobs. If you look at uh, nuclear security and operations, we do work for the NNSA to support modernization of, of our, our nuclear fleet. So we're building uh, facilities to support fabrication of weapons and weapons integration, um, specifically in the areas of uh, plutonium and uranium processing. Uh, the nuke power side, we're, we're building the only new nuclear plant in the United States at, at Vogel down in Georgia. And on the environmental side, we're, we're doing cleanup activities that support um, you know, remediation of, of threats that were left there since the Manhattan Project. So if you look at, you know, kind of the nuclear mission uh, in our, our business, we actually cover the entire life cycle of nuclear uh, within our business. And, um, and again, the projects that are supported from an infrastructure perspective are, are very, very complex uh, across all of those domains. Next slide. Uh, I really liked... Uh, uh, this uh, quote from uh, Hyman Brickover, uh, you know, the, the father of our, our nuclear Navy. Amazing when you think about it, that he helped to develop our, our Navy uh, nuclear program and was literally in control of its operations for three decades. Um, I think the, the, the message about it, and I know this resonates with our customers and, and our colleagues, uh, that, uh, you know, when we execute a job, we feel like we own it. And, you know, our best days are not only uh, working closely with our customers and being able to deliver a job, but at the same time, uh, knowing that, that the significant work that was done will be there for perpetuity uh, to support generations to come and, and the missions that go along with it. So uh, keeping that in mind, um, yeah, that's just become a part of our DNA. And um, that's what what's, you know, basically turns us on every day. Next slide. Um, so it, advances of uh, alternate uh, delivery methods from our perspective, and I know that um, you know Mike Rossi talk, talked about the mechanics and, and what the what's been done, what the FAR allows, um, certain things in the FAR that aren't stated to give uh, customers the flexibility to implement um, the best acquisition strategy. Uh, I would say that if you look at projects, not um, not every um, execution model fits for every project. I mean, uh, there's uh, there's always challenging site conditions, schedules, unique requirements that customers may have. We spend a lot of time up front focusing on the things that are, ne that are needed to refine those requirements. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the project lifecycle slide coming up. Uh, it's all about collaboration and making sure that those requirements are defined early and defined well, so we don't have uh, design churn and and design changes that we need to focus on. And, um, and we really focus on making sure that the supply chain can support. Uh, I know that even with, with the pandemic and even prior to the pandemic, the supply chain has been fairly uh, challenged with being able to meet customer requirements. And so we're constantly focused on the things that we need to do to keep them qualified and give them a heads up on work that's on the horizon. Next slide. Okay, so so you uh, most of you have probably seen this slide before, but I, I'll tell you that uh, rather than talking about design, bid, build, I'll talk about where we start, and it's all about getting uh, the requirements right. And if if the customer is struggling with trying to determine what those requirements are, you start the value engineering there, right up in that conceptual planning phase. So we're uh, very fortunate in working with. Admiral, Admiral Adamitz and his team, the PMS 555 organization uh, with uh, Naval Infrastructure work to be involved in the 1391. And the 1391 that we did was a little bit unique than most because we had the opportunity to create a 5% design, the entire execution plan, the risk model, and, and be in a position where we were really identifying the things that we needed to do with the Navy up front to ensure that the right requirements were laid in place uh, well before the 1391 made its way to Congress. And, and so we prefer ECI. We prefer, as was noted before, um, integrated uh, project, uh, I mean, integrated uh, procurement and construction. Um, in that environment, the, some folks will say, well, you know, you're awarding the contract to, to, uh, to, to one firm. Well, well, in essence, what happens 
is that the, the EPC firm will basically take the uh, program integrator role working in partnership with a customer. So we have the uh, knowledge, skills, influences, uh, processes, systems in place to bring on subcontractors, get the supply base qualified, managed uh, within the factories and in the field, um, establish partners. Um, if you have, let's say, an AE firm that has marine engineering experience that is of value to us and we need to have that built into the team and we establish partnerships with those firms we establish all the local labor agreements uh, the logistics plans everything that it takes to execute a job and then that's all woven together in, into a strong team and then like i noted in my comments earlier uh, we do it in an open book way you know we share our financials with the customer directly so we're being fully transparent on how we're performing to their baseline and uh, once the baseline is in place, then all of that flows into our tools. If you're doing that up front in a conceptual design uh, phase, conceptual planning phase, you will be in a better position to mitigate risks downstream where you have the potential busting your schedule um, or, your, or your budget. And so uh, most of the projects that I'm gonna talk about in, in this uh, package, uh, they kind of vibrate between integrated EPC and, and design build. Next slide. Um, and so, talk, you know, talking a little bit about integrated EC, EPC, and I'm not going to touch on every one of these bullets, but I hit the highlights. Beginning with the end in mind means that we have to be aligned with the customer up front on their mission. I always, you know, talk with customers. I said, what's driving your mission? When do you need to have things done? Uh, we go back to my team and try to come up with a differentiated solution that's going to uh, position us well so we can deliver against uh, that particular need. Um, are in our organization, engineering serve and procurement serve construction. And <clears throat> when you're talking about doing the kind of EPC work that we do, having those two organizations, engineering and procurement working up front with construction will help us design into and procure into uh, the best uh, acquisition model that we can, uh, that we can lay in, in, in place uh, to meet the customer's objectives. Um, I know we've had recent conversations with Admiral Adamitz along with our industry partners around uh, work packaging and uh, some of the, the things that we've done there, very innovative ways to make sure that how we package our work flows through how we, we order materials, how engineering completes their efforts um, to serve construction. And that's what it's all about. Um, aligning our team and becoming one team, single point of contact, uh, context and accountability between the customer and us is, is paramount and and just building up a strong partnership and and trust with the customer because there's going to be some really great days and there's going to be some tough days where the customer and the contractor need to think through the challenges that they face and uh, craft the best solution for the project and uh, the last thing <clears throat> that i'd mention is uh, from a quality standpoint you have to be in a, a position where you're focusing on every single interface and as all, you, all of you know, um, the, the handoffs, those handoffs that happen within uh, all of our projects matter so much. And if there's a, a bumpy handoff or there's a gap, um, you're, you're likely to have an issue with rework and other things like that. They're gonna get in the way of, of uh, completing the job. Um, so it's all about quality and most importantly, uh, safety and protecting our people uh, who are our most important assets. Um, so in bold, uh, to anchor these focus areas, uh, we've done a lot of research with CII and, uh, they, they, through that research have identified the benefits of, of this approach. Uh, next slide. Okay. So I'm going to talk about projects. This is an exciting part. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is, um, touch projects and the different execution models that we have for each of them, uh, in, um, Bluegrass or uh, Richmond, Kentucky and Pueblo, Colorado, we, we built um, two uh, demilitarization plants. Um, these plants are, have been constructed to um, eradicate um, the United States of uh, nerve agents uh, at the Bluegrass plant, uh, the one that's on the left, the picture that you see there. Uh, that plant is currently in operations today, destroying VX, mustard and, and uh, GB nerve agent, really nasty stuff. 
Um, all of this work that's, that's done is, is done remotely. And I think there's a, on the next slide, we'll show you in a second, uh, a video of how that work is done. Um, it was uh, integrated design, build, and systemization activity uh, that's uh, allowed us to work with our partners to, to operate and then eventually close the plant because the plant that you see there will be taken down to the ground and restored to its, uh, its original uh, configuration. Uh, the plant in Pueblo, Colorado is uh, destroying mustard munitions. And, um, you know, these are all one of, one, uh, uh, one of a kind facilities. Um, they're integrated through their entire life cycle. There's a lot of handoffs in these plants, but the mission is all about eradicating these weapons by uh, December of 2023, for which we're on track. And uh, so we're really proud of the performance of these two jobs. Um, so let's go to the next slide and we'll talk. I think you guys could probably play the video. Hopefully the, the technology works for us. Twenty twenty was another year of steady progress at the Bluegrass Chemical Agent Destruction Pilot Plant, or BG Cap, in Kentucky. The BG Cap workforce destroyed one of three types of munitions stored at the Bluegrass Army Depot, all while implementing new safety protocols during the coronavirus pandemic to help prevent the spread of COVID nineteen. Anyway, BG Cap um, is currently using two technologies to destroy just, uh, the chemical. Right now, in the interest of time. Uh, you do have a link, so click on the video and, and uh, you can see it. But, but essentially what you'll get a, a perspective of is in these hot zones, uh, how we uh, remotely uh, destroy these munitions uh, at the bluegrass plant. So too bad you didn't get a chance to see it here, but uh, you'll, you'll still have access to it. So, uh, so please do take a look. Um, you know, uh, the comment here about steady progress uh, uh, um, across difficult times or among difficult times, um, when we ran into the pandemic, we worked with the Army, the CDC, and came up with a plan uh, to keep uh, both plants up and operating. And we actually uh, increased and improved our destruction rates during, during this period of time, which is you know, a little counterintuitive, but uh, it really speaks to the, to the drive and the human spirit of, of, of people in our country uh, that when uh, given an opportunity take cell and perform in any mission uh, to support uh, our nation, our allies and the warfighter that, uh, that we know how to get it done. So we're really proud of that. Um, let's uh, hit the next slide. Uh, this is a uranium processing facility in, in, um, in Tennessee. Um, it, 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 again, the mission is around nuclear modernizations, how our country uh, produces uranium in, um, in a very much like the bluegrass facility, very high tech, very dangerous uh, environment. Um, we, we have to follow strict NQA1 standards on this job. It is integrated EPC systemization and commissioning, but at the same time, you know, we're, we're working in a very iterative uh, fashion uh, with the customer, uh, customer to, to mature the design in some cases as we're building. And uh, just as a function of the complexity, it's a cost plus award fee and a cost milestone um, a contract that we have here. Uh, I would say that when you look at this project, much like most of our jobs, uh, it is a one team approach whereby um, it doesn't matter if you're looking at somebody that's a subcontractor or the NNSA customer or our folks that are executing the work. Uh, it all uh, gives the appearance of one team because they're highly integrated in the work that they do. And uh, it's very, very complex construction work considering the nature of the nuclear materials that they're handling in that facility. Um, the next pro project to showcase, uh, you know, I spent a little bit of time down at uh, Los Alamos uh, managing cap capital projects for the lab there. And uh, we built a, a facility there. It's uh, basically called the, the RULOP facility and um, a very complex uh, design build and a collaborative optioneering um, a project whereby the customer was still trying to define the requirements of uh, the, um, the complexities around how we were, um, see what I can say, uh, fine tuning and improving the mission by which we were building pits 
uh, was being um, uh, essentially uh, designed on the fly and uh, leveraging all the ex expertise um, that uh, that they had in the lab. And, um, and so very complex uh, set of work that was done with the supply chain, people that had um, uh, the qualifications to do NQA1 work, complex testing there in, in, those, um, in those facilities, and then uh, ensuring that um, all of the pieces were being integrated well into an environment uh, where, where folks um, uh, were um, essentially uh, performing hazardous operations. And, um, and, and then thinking about how that all plays with- Hey, Mike. Um, yeah. I Mike, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, you're starting to lag a little bit. Um, maybe maybe drop your camera and just go audio for your last couple of slides. We're, we're starting to get a pretty uh, decent lag. Let's try that. You're, you're, you're mute. Okay, go ahead. Does that sound better, Sal? Yeah, we got you. Go ahead. Okay, sounds good. And, and so when you, you, you talk about the, the work that's being done up in, in northern New Mexico and in uh, – in, in the, Los, the town of Los Alamos in a, in a fairly remote area, very, very difficult to find qualified labor and subcontractors that uh, can, can essentially uh, design, build, and, and execute design, build work. Um, and so uh, a pretty impressive uh, a building that we've established there. I would say that the integration here, uh, much like the work that we've done with the NNSA at, uh, at UPF, um, has uh, has been recognized as being not only under budget, but at the same time, uh, some of the best projects that they've ever executed for which uh, our team and the NNSA team were recognized with the Project Management Excellence Award. Um, so, you know, again, this is another uh, delivery model that's that's a, a bit different uh, than, um, than what you would see in kind of your standard design build approach. And, um, and, and you know, the key to it was leveraging the expertise within the NNSA to design uh, in parallel as, as we were building the plant. Um, and and the, the, the last project I wanna showcase is, uh, is a, really a fantastic um, um, job in, in the fact that it's so unique because it supports manned space flight, uh, providing NASA with a heavy lift capability uh, to uh, uh, afford us the ability to colonize moon, the moon and, uh, and support human life and, and the space economy in, in our solar system. Um, the requirements uh, to support a launch vehicle in, in this environment are very, very rigorous. And, uh, you know, the, the type of integrity of the work we do, much like the NNSA work where everything is um, being built to the highest quality standards, you, you really have the same environment in doing work with NASA. It's a design, build, integrated EPC project, cost plus award fee. Um, I, I will say that even though it's a cost plus project, we treat it uh, like it's a, a lump sum job. You have to because that's what's necessary for us to uh, keep our, our customers pleased with what we're delivering. And, um, you know, we integrate very, very closely our designs with the launch vehicle designs just to make sure that how the launch vehicle is coupled to the launch pad that the analytical tools that we use um, can uh, ensure that, that we're meeting all the requirements at the vehicle level. And then of course, uh, you know, the tools we use in the field to, to model how the work is being done, how work packages are being integrated together, how that all ties into the supply chain and, and the delivery of, of engineering designs. You know, we do that through the technologies that we've developed within our functional organizations. and. Um, and so that's gone pretty well. And uh, I mean, performing work in this environment def uh, demands perfection. So um, it's a great job. And then, uh, you know, kind of my off the stage slide is, um, you know, it, our customer's mission is our mission and it has to be that way. And, um, you know, we, um, we're one team. And if, if you're not one team, then it's gonna, it'll be a tough ride. And uh, the plant that you see here is uh, you know, not a plant that we've built within the Defense and Space Organization, but another uh, couple of trains that were built for um, an LNG project on the Gulf Coast with uh, uh, a firm named Chenier. 
And uh, I would say that uh, this is uh, this amplifies who Bechtel is and and the kind of complex work that we do to deliver for our customers and uh, the investments that they're making in us. Um, in the end, uh, for the defense and space work that we do, it, um, specifically the, the DOD, it is our having the ability to deliver the lethality that's necessary for the warfighter to, uh, to do well in, in, um, in the field and, uh, and uh, post superior performance against our adversaries. And, and so that's what we're all about. And uh, Sal, I guess I'll turn it back to you and I'll try to turn my camera on and see if that works, but. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, there you are, Mark. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I mean, I, I know Bechtel's uh, working on some really exciting things, and that's not to say that others in the industry are not. I recognize there are a lot of other firms that could have given the same perspective that Bechtel just provided us. Uh, they had some pretty neat examples of some large-scale projects with a variety of different governmental clients, which is why uh, they were asked to be part of this. So, Mike, thanks for sharing, and thanks for taking time uh, to highlight the types of projects and when they work and what the uh, parameters generally are to make them successful. So thanks very much for that. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, so here we are. Um, you know, we had a Rickover quote earlier. Well, we, we have a Winston Churchill quote as well. And as I said at the beginning of this presentation, uh, this was just going to be the beginning. So, you know, now this is not the end. Uh, it's not even the beginning of the end. It is perhaps the end of the beginning. And what I mean by that is, um, we knew that in two, two and a half hours, even with this phenomenal lineup of speakers, we would not be able to answer all the questions that are out there. And I'm going to go to those here in just a few minutes. Um, and and we'll, we'll tee some of those up. But as I mentioned um, about 45 minutes ago, we will be forming um, a working group that is going to ultimately um, unpack this topic a little bit more uh, over the next, I guess it's down to six or seven weeks now prior to the Joint Engineering Training Conference. Um, at that time, ideally, we're going to be able to uh, present this to the uh, executive advisory group, the EAG. That's the name of the old USAG, the Uniform Services Advisory Group. This is something that's very important to uh, Mr. Mike McAndrew and OSD. So Mike has been championing this. Um, there will be a white paper uh, that will ultimately be developed. And, uh, you know, I'll let uh, Mike put his own words to it. But um, we are looking for um, all the good ideas that are out there. Uh, everything's in discussion right now. Uh, the work group will be looking at barriers, challenges, uh, essentially doing effectively, we'll call it a SWOT, you know, uh, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, where are the opportunities that we need to be investigating to best move forward and help DOD uh, address some of their program delivery challenges. And frankly, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this is all about keeping the conversation alive. I think it was on Mike Rossi's slide where he said, you know, alternative delivery is not dead, it's just dormant. Um, you know, we, we have to continue to uh, find uh, options and uh, figure out how to advance this for government uh, so that the government gets what they want and what they need at a cost and time that they can live with, but also for industry. We have a shrinking pool of, of contractors that want to play in this space uh, because of all the things that we talked about earlier, some of the barriers to entry. So um, last couple of administrative comments, and, and then we'll, we'll go to some question and, uh, and answer. Um, uh, you will be getting your uh, PDHs, uh, CEU uh, certifications at, um, after this. Uh, you'll get those from uh, from uh, SAME. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and, and the questions that we don't get to, uh, we'll make sure we address in some form or format and make sure we get back out to everybody. So, can I could, um, uh, drop the slides? And then if I could have all my speakers, uh, please come back. Uh, those uh, that their cameras are still working. Um, and so what's happened here is uh, Pat is an overachiever and he went and started answering all the questions that were in the question bar. And uh, yeah, there goes sinking in the screen. So that as much as I appreciate Pat doing that, uh, and, and, uh, and generally I really do, the problem is the way big time or big marker works is as soon as something is answered, it moves it out of the new uh, tab and into the answer tab. So uh, there isn't necessarily opportunities uh, to uh, vote things up or for everyone to see that. So I'm going to go to the answered tab and I'm going to open some of these back up again. And we're going to talk about them a little bit as a group. Uh, and bearing in mind that Pat has already provided some color commentary to pretty much everything that was asked, including administrative questions. He's so good. So, all right. So uh, anyway, with that, uh, John, it's great to see you're on uh, Admiral Adamance. 
Uh, he had made a comment about 90% uh, of uh, Milcom projects last year were um, executed and about 50% of that, I think it's supposed to be 50% were on time. Um, here's the question though, continue to engage with industry and stakeholders to improve outcome. Um, I have heard from industry a few times that they should consider OTAs, other transactional authorities to improve outcomes. Any examples of federal execution agents using OTA? Um, Mike, let me let me start Mike McAndrew with three mics. I'll make sure I uh, specify which mic I'm gonna ask. Uh, what are your thoughts on on OTAs, uh, especially in the milk arena? Well, I, I know they've, they've got an uptick and anytime we get something new that has an uptick, people think it's kind of the next fad and so they just keep using it and using it. Uh, I haven't seen a whole, whole lot used in the construction area yet, but uh, other areas like land acquisitions, I've seen it. Um, I also am hearing that some people are using it on the edge of um, goodness. And so I think it, they do have their place. I think OTAs don't, do have their place, but we want to make sure we don't abuse something like that so that later on, either Congress or the contracting community are going to come online and kind of limit its, its, its benefit from us. So definitely, if you're going to consider doing something like this, I want to make sure you get your contracting and your lawyers in the room uh, early on to say, okay, what are your boundaries? And see, and that'll help you determine really, I think, it, you know, is it really going to be much more benefit than any other other tool that you have in the toolkit? But I, I, I have heard really good things about the OTAs. Um, and I don't know that and I, maybe the industry guys will know where they've actually used it in construction. Yeah, let me go to Pat real quick on that. Pat, you answered the Admiral with a website there. Can you give us a 30 second summary of what that's all about? I can. There was just it was a it was a blog post, but it was from the acquisitions community. And it looks like acquisitions community is getting better at, at posting quick, concise information answers. So that was nice. And there were a few items on there like it can't exceed 500 million. And so some of these mega projects, it would not uh, work for so that people just need to know what the uh, the far, just like we said, I mean, you have to know the traditional rules and so no uh, going into it, just like Mike Rossi and, and the others know on here, but uh, cannot exceed 500 million. But and then there's a few other things on that link uh, if you open up that, that link there. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, either one of the other mics, did you want to comment on that one at all for OTAs? A little head shake either way, no? Okay. All right, let me, let me move down. The next one are more comments than questions, but there's some discussion. I'm going to wrap it into a question, though. Um, uh, there's some commentary about P3 as a potential way to deliver projects using the VA Omaha Clinic as an example. Mike uh, McAndrew, I'll start with you again. What's the, what's the government's appetite, uh, federal government uh, exploring P3 as a delivery? Um, I, I think we, our appetite is, is wedded to it, but I got to tell you, we've got a lot of concerns over certain P3s, particularly where, you know, it comes down to the question of who's going to be the owner of the asset. Um, and then and then when you start peeling back, okay, what's the proposal? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to own it? Then you start getting into, is it really P3 or not? So it's really getting in to define the concept. I, I think each of the military departments has different varying uh, um, mechanisms for how they approach their P3 analysis. Um, so I, I think it, it really comes down to what the proposal is. Uh, we use it in the ULs. Uh, that's kind of a P3 thing. Um, so bring the project forward and let's see what it is to see if it's really going to have, uh, you know, merit within the P3 community. Okay. okay. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to pose the next question to uh, both other mics and uh, Pat. Um, Aaron Phillips had asked ECI, at what point in the design did the contractor get involved? I, I imagine Aaron was asking specifically, um, Pat, of one of your uh, projects that you were probably talking about, but your answer to him was very clear as early as possible, uh, along with design award. Let me ask both mics. I'll start with Mike Rossi. In your experience, you know, other than saying as early as possible, what is the right time? Um, so of, of all the projects I showed, they it came in at, you know, everything from, I said, the, the most aggressive was Fort Riley. That was at before even the design charrette. For that particular project, and so like uh, five concept, you know, it's a yeah, it, it was, it was at that point. Yeah. We got okay. somebody coming. We got somebody coming in as part of the BRAC program. Here's the budget. Just figure it out. Um, the so you know, I'd say if you're doing it at thirty five percent, you're you're probably you're not, you're never too late. Like I said, at Leavenworth, we went backwards and kind of fixed what they found, but. But on the curves that uh, Mike Costage sh showed that everybody's kind of familiar with, it really, 
um, it really you're you're stuck with kind of the, the small answers at that point in time instead of the big ideas mm -hmm. once you get past thirty five percent. So, you know, if you could bring somebody, if you can select somebody and bring them in, you know, before that piece, you know, right after programmatic, I think you're probably better off on the, on the federal side. I mean, at least that's what the empirical evidence kind of bears out. You know, get yeah. them in there early. Um, they have the that that'll bring the big ideas for. Um, you know, techniques, constructability, no. to, they kind of understand the market and, you know, so I'd go with that. Yeah, I, I would add, is, you know, all, all of the jobs that, that we showcased here, um, construction and startup or startup and commissioning organization, procurement, they all mobilized with engineering. They all did. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a, you know, the, the entire construction organization, let's say, that, that you would see where, you know, field man, uh, non-manuals are, are supporting an activity in the field. It wasn't that kind of organization, but it was the kind of people that you needed uh, to do constructability analysis well up front. And then at the same time, make sure that all your work planning and your work workflows that are created, that are establishing how you're going to execute the job on the back end, that all of that's done very well uh, as engineering is designing. Um, so, Sal, if this is my cross, if I got one additional ad here, um, the, the tool, the project delivery tool, you know, sometimes you don't get what you want. I mean, you know, it's maybe the agency's not ready to do something. I'm thinking that um, um, Mike Costa showed Bechtel's involvement in ML2 for, for NASA. And, you know, I had the luxury of, you know, NASA got a hold of us and got a hold of BCI and got a hold of me and said, you know, we're, we're thinking about ECI or we're thinking about CMR at risk. Can you come and talk to us? And, you know, we went and gave them about a day of kind of this is how it works and how you use the FAR and you work through it. And they went back to their agency. The agency says, we're just not culturally ready to jump from design, bid, build to, to, to this. Um, how can we how can we figure this out? And so we went back to the, with NASA, spent about two days with them you know, with the whiteboard that was, you know, 25 yards long and said, what's important to you? What kind of teammate do you want? What are your biggest risks in, in this particular project? How can we write the procurement or the solicitation to address each of these risks? And we came up with, you know, cost reimbursable, you know, award, award fee, you know, is, is what it, it did. And, and the point of that matter was, you know, how are you going to pick the best teammate? Is your process going to allow you to pick the best teammate? Because you're, you're in a the situation where I talked where you've got undefined everything's kind of undefined. You just kind of know when you need it by and, and the target is moving every day as they're developing the, you know, the, the rocket that they're trying to push off this thing and Mike and the Bechtel crew is, is dealing with it. So, so sometimes you have to move the, the procurement model, the delivery method, you know, to, tr to try to mitigate the risk. One way to mitigate this risk was to get the contract, the constructor into this thing as early as you can. And we used as an example for NASA, we said, well, the IHNC, that big catcher's mid out in the Gulf, you know, was a design build cost reimbursable contract. I think Shaw and it used to be Shaw ended up, you know, being the principal on that thing. And it was on the cover of ENR. And, you know, that's, that's how the New Orleans district had to solve that particular problem. Um, and, and it, and it worked. And we kind of use that as a model, albeit a lot of the technical factors were different because they had NASA had different risks, but, but that's, you know, the, the truth is, is that the owner's got to walk through all of his risks what the heck were you know what the heck can go wrong got to th be real thoughtful to try to figure out what's most important to him and, and write the selection or the solicitation so that he selects the right teammate in the right compensation model to kind of mitigate all those risks and try to deliver the project in a way that's most important to him on time or on budget or both so hey so this is mike one thing i would like to ask is, is this question in particular be part of the white paper um, this is kind of what I want to get at. Is, you know, it's part of, hey, when does something like this actually work? So have, right. have a group of folks get, to get, get together. Like, at what point is the best or most optimum time? Although it may not be happening in every project. But this is the kind of question I would want to, uh, you know, address in either policy or something of that nature through that white paper. All right. Good. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Pat, I want to jump to you real quick. Um, there was a question that was asked and you answered, but I want you to elaborate. It was from William uh, Mura said, use the term, re quote, really, truly partner, unquote. In your view, what characteristics, uh, characteristics distinguish that from, quote, unquote, regular partnering? And I want to, uh, and I think there's a, there's a, there's a theme here. Uh, Mike Rossi uh, made the same thing. There was a comment of, 
uh, co compliance versus uh, culture of excellence. There's the trust word that I used. Um, b build on that a little bit, uh, please, Pat. When I was younger, I did a partnering exercise with NAVFAC and it was facilitated and it was, I was very young and so I liked it a lot. We did things like drop mixed tails and it told things about our inner, it was almost like taking a Cosmo quiz. And that while it was fun, I think it was really good for project partnering. Uh, what is better is when you really use a tool like the matrix tool that you're creating for mitigating risk or those familiar with the CII's project definition rating index, where it makes you think about the types of things that you know could happen, but you haven't really thought to check yet. And maybe that would be when you find that there are uh, mustard munitions below the child development center at our bases or these types of things where you really truly go mitigate the risk ahead of time and you know who's responsible for what. And so another great tool that you can use is the BIM project execution plan. Uh, that's it, It's now standardized. It's the same for the Army Corps of Engineers as it is for the Air Force. There were two separate ones, but they've unified under one. And what's so good about that is it controls who's in charge of what. And then once you're actually in the clash detection and um, deconfliction phase, who, who, who trumps the others? And so you have to have these specific items that really focus on who's doing what and what will happen if things go wrong. We know they will. So you got you to put something concrete on that, not just to Cosmo quiz about personality types. Um, great, thanks. Um, let's uh, stay muted unless we're the speaker. Give me a little bit of feedback. Um, so appreciate that. Anybody else want to comment on that partnering concept? Mike Rossi, I'm seeing you nod, uh, nod your head. No, I'd just like to reiterate all the times I've kind of had past experience when I was a captain and went through my first my first big project when I was out in an office. But um, I thought the ones that work best are the ones, and I said it in my brief, maybe it wasn't too clear. You, you got to come away with a way to say, look, we're going to run into problems here. You know, and we're we're that we can't anticipate. Say, for example, we we get a big risk matrix and we figure everything out. Still, something's going to come up in which there's going to be heads butting. You know, the design guys and the the con construction guys that are informing the design, they're going to come in and say, "Look, I'm just telling you that this is the way it works." And you know, and there's pride of authorship for all these people and how they do things, particularly the design guys. And and the owner is going to say, "Look, it's it. I know it's a hospital, but it's a it's a VA hospital. That's a different hospital than your hospital." But it's going to happen. It's inevitable. And, and if, if in the partnering session, in my mind, before the first problem ever hits you, if you can figure out how are we going to solve problems, we don't know what that problem is yet, but let's, let's put together a process for this team that's going to solve problems so nothing gets stale. So we can progress this thing. Um, and you know what? We're just going to have to be invested from our own agencies or from our companies or firms with the authority to kind of progress this project. Um, and in the government, sometimes that's hard. So you got to figure out, you know, who that's going to be. Um, but so, so things don't die in the, in the, in the partnering sessions that solve that and walk away from it with that, from my both participation and then from my observation in other ones are the ones that, you know, are vested in, you know, they you know, are vested in getting the thing solved and getting things solved and moving the project and, you know, getting results makes for good partnerships. They all start feeling good about themselves, you know, that they, that they figure it out, so. Thanks, Mike. Uh, could not agree more. And I know uh, Mike McAndrew could add some color on that, but we are, uh, what what Pat referenced earlier was OSD's uh, project management agreement. That's uh, still in draft, uh, in beta test, that addresses a lot of what we're talking about here in terms of pulling the parties together early in the process and establishing uh, methods to uh, resolve issues and escalation ladders and points of uh, of accountability and, and things like that, all important terms to Mike and OSD uh, when he, he gave us our marching orders of uh, what, what was to be important in that document. So we look forward to sharing more on that as that comes out of beta here uh, soon. Okay, I'm going to move over to the active uh, questions now. I think we addressed everything that was in the answer. Uh, we had to shut uh, Pat down at one point, tell him not to answer any more questions. So, but like a good... Uh, former Air Force officer, he was able to comply. Um, the, uh, the top couple vote getters are more commentary about uh, success with ECI, uh, whether it was a San Antonio Medical, NGA, Fort Belvoir, Fort Hospital. So thank you all for that uh, validating commentary. Terry Watkins has a point in there about back in the day, uh, back, uh, you know, we all remember when we were all young captains, 
There was a, a concept of partnering that seemed to be worth the effort. I think that's what we just talked about, about bringing people together and actively working things and ensuring that uh, we are all, in fact, re remember that we all have the same objective in mind, and that's to deliver something on behalf of our, of our nation. Um, let me get to the next real question. It's from uh, Brian, and it's for you, Mike. It says, Mr. McAndrew, when will we see the same excitement for use of permanent materials, et cetera, but uh, could be means as methods for, oh wait, I jumped, that question just moved. Uh, same excitement and energy from DOD construction agents uh, to aggressively pursue uh, ADM for construction projects. Great conversation, I look forward to seeing, forward to seeing projects using ADM. Thanks for your support. Thanks for your support. And Brian, I think the, the, the simple answer to that is uh, when we start getting some successes. You know, we've been doing these, I think some of the answers out there where we have about 6% that we, we, we have done or said, uh, 14 maybe percent. Uh, we, we do some of the ADM or ECI, CM at risk, what do you want to call it again? It is going on in the background, They're usually smaller projects. I am working with the core on a project coming up that is going to be fairly sizable that they want to use this process on. And, I, and I've challenged them to use this as a pilot to do it right. You know, this is one of the ones why I want the white paper is I want to be able to provide them. Here's how we think it's supposed to work. Follow this template. Tell me where you have to deviate from it, why you're deviating from it, and then follow this through to success so that we can get a good template on how the feds are going to use this process going forward. And at least it's, some, it's, a, it's a basis for how we can we can navigate and do more of this and when is the best time to use it. Um, I mean, I, the sad part for me, I, it seems to me that every project would be, would be advantaged by having the contractors in early to see the design and see what's going on, to be able to comment on it so that we're not fixing a lot of those problems after uh, we, we've got a contract award all, um, and the contractors, uh, the construction contractors out there, and uh, we're doing it in the middle of the project. So I'd like to see us do more of it, but I, got, I, I think before we start jumping in with both feet like we did with design build when it first kind of hit the fad circuit, uh, I'd like to I'd like to make sure we we as a construction agents the the, the NAFAC and the core and AFCAC really understand when it's best best to be used and when to deviate from it. Over. Thanks, Mike. You know what I will add is uh, this conversation is occurring. You know we've got Mike McAndrew representing OSD, but um, I know uh, Admiral Corka and his team uh, and USAs have all uh, out of a, a working group, or I guess it was a. It was a round table that we had back at the small business conference and we had attendees representing uh, the DCAs. And there, there does appear to be uh, an appetite to at least uh, explore some of these uh, methods more than we have in, in the recent past. Hence the idea of this working group, which again, um, we will try to populate the working group with personnel that represent the different portions of our society so we can truly understand perspective and not you know, all uh, result in an echo chamber of us all telling ourselves what we already know. So um, uh, more to come on that. So, okay, uh, moving down, it, there's actually a dialogue. William Pott asks a question. I think John Carlson did a great job of answering him. So I'm going to kind of skip that uh, one for now and move down to uh, uh, Rich Houghton asked a question. Has anyone broken the code on how to best tap the skills of privatized utility system owners in Milcom? Uh, I'm not even sure where to throw that one. Does anyone want to Take that one on. Um, anyone have any experience about uh, Mike's giving a big, Mike Ross, he was putting the cross up. No, don't throw it to him. Um, anyone? You might have, you might have stumped the, uh, stumped the panel. Well, well, likely given that the answer is that nobody wants the question is like, no, no one's broken a code. Um, to me, you, utility privatization in and of itself is uh, about the max we could probably introduce it into the Milcon process because now we can, I think, do milk you know, constructed activities in there. But if I'm doing a utility privatization, why would I want to use appropriated dollars to pay for it? So it's one of those um, it's a kind of an oxymoron type thing at this point until we can see uh, maybe, Rich, you want to uh, provide a model on where you think it would. Uh, I'll take a white paper on that too. Um, but you, you start, you start, going down a weird contractual relationship when you have privatized utility guys along with a normal Milcon, Milcon process. So I, I, I'd like to see how you'd shape it before we would determine whether it's on the table or off the table. Over. Yeah, I can, I can, uh, I can get with Rich and see if we can get some more information on that. Um, Mike Costas, the next one is for you. And I think you were trying to get some clarification as well on the question, but um, the question is what are the common characteristics specific? And I don't know the acronym 
to the DORS. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I've got it. Uh, Ryan uh, provided clarification on that. Okay. Yeah, so a uh, DOR designer of record. Um, okay. You know, literally, and, and I know the Jacobs organization does this uh, really well too, um, that uh, always start the job off working directly with the customer, uh, specifically their chief engineers on, um, on design threats. Uh, because, uh, you know, for the most part, I think everybody, you know, you, you bid into the job thinking you know all the requirements. Then you, then you realize when you're on the job, you don't know all the requirements. There are certain things that are unknowns, and, uh, and that needs to be worked through up front. And so what we do is we always start um, early on working on those design charrettes, uh, then establish um, the, uh, the means by which uh, our, our project engineering manager is working within the systems uh, engineering team to get all of those uh, requirements parsed across the entire EPC. And, and, and when you talk about um, you know, alternative de delivery met, uh, methods, um, the key thing that happens up front, and we always have to remember this, and it's very, very difficult at times, especially if you're in a design bid build environment, is having the engineering folks working with the customer and the contractor at the same time ensures that the requirements that are being parsed get spun across all the engineering disciplines, but also the, the, uh, the supplier in the supply chain, of course, and also um, the construction team. And so once our uh, requirements are parsed and they're fed into our requirements management system, then that gives us the ability to, to be able to manage those requirements and ensure through our design matrices that those requirements are being achieved uh, through our verifications and validations that we have in place. A very rigorous process it kind of takes you from cradle to grave on how we manage those requirements. And I know a lot of contractors are, are doing that out there. Um, uh, we, we're, we're pretty uh, um, uh, lucky in that uh, in the environment that we design into, we, we uh, manage the data seamlessly uh, between all elements of the EPC. So uh, from our engineering models and our PNIDs, let's say, that data will flow right into how we procure and how we construct. And everything is packaged in an automated way to ensure that uh, there's no gaps in execution. And, uh, but it's all managed through systems engineering and our requirements management system. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thanks Ryan, that's a great question. Pat, let me go to you for the uh, last one in the Q&A right now, uh, asking for a little bit more information on your uh, uh, D-bomb method there, or D-bomb, bomb, boom, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Um, but uh, if you could share a little bit more on that in terms of the financing, revenue sources, et cetera. These are pretty complex, and that's probably why uh, we haven't done them, because it, it does get messy in a hurry. But let me just give you a few quick examples that make it easy. Texas A&M is the largest university in the country with 70,000 students. Uh, we, we've been sharing back and forth with the University of Central Florida, but our chancellor is very uh, pro P3 because we have a lot of very large developed student residence complexes that they bring the capital in, multifamily housing, giant projects are built, and then there's some sort of expectation of occupancy uh, for students being in these large apartment complexes, which it gets the question of post COVID world, how do you bring students back into the university? And so, so they're not without risk, but then you have another project that is more government oriented. Uh, GSA is going to facilitate the renting out of a project that is built by a developer in Washington, DC. And then the client is the department of transportation. And so there are, that was a Clark project that was built by our industry relations coordinator, uh, professor Hernan Garros Santos. And so there are all these different types of arrangements, but when you have the, when the object is to rent the space or to do a toll road, there are monetary projections and calculations that you can use that all things considered, uh, you know that you're gonna calculate your return on investment and that's where you can plan for mutual benefit. And you really should do that on the CLINs and on the earned value management system of a project uh, but you especially do it on a D-bomb project because, as you saw, they put those curtain walls all the way out to the, the easements of the property. And so every single space was going to be rented in that research facility because they looked to take paid research and then rent out the space accordingly. And so uh, there's no one size fits all, but that's what you'd have to do. It's everyone is going to focus on on the money, on the quan. So that's that's the key with a D-bomb. 
Yeah, that, that's going to be a, a challenge, obviously, for federal procurement. Uh, you know, the DOD is not in the business of revenue generation. So when you start thinking about income streams and things like that. And uh, again, uh, was that a Jerry Maguire reference that you just made there as well? I don't know. I'm full of I'm full of lots of useless references. Uh, that was pretty good. Uh, a little a little Quan reference there. I didn't know how many people picked that one up. So, all right, um, let's uh, let's get to tying a bow here. It's getting late. Uh, sun is starting to set. Um, uh, Callie asked the question: Will progressive design build uh, with far twigs be a delivered method that will be further developed as part of the working group? Short answer to that is. Um, Everything is on the table for discussion right now, uh, Kelly. That's the whole premise behind the working group. So again, I'll, I'll use this as a shameless plug for those that are still on. We had almost 300 at one point. I think we're down about 225 right now. Um, uh, not everyone's going to get selected. Just like when we built the team uh, through our 25, 28,000 person SAME society to help craft the 2025 strat plan, we had three or four times more volunteers than we could realistically put on the working group. Um, we had to pick and choose so that we represented all sectors that we're, that we're looking at. So hopefully uh, some of our listeners are interested in being part of this. They'll go through that relatively easy five-minute survey monkey, and then we'll be able to uh, uh, pick the team that can discuss your question as well as many others that have come up. So thanks. Um, Mike, to your, uh, for your, uh, Mike McAndrew, one of three Mikes, uh, for your edification, Rich Houghton added a little bit more reference there on the UP uh, question. But again, I, I don't want to, Necessarily tee that right now. Uh, yeah, right now. Conversation. He knows how to find me. <laughs> right. Fair enough. Okay. All right. I'm moving over to chat. Uh, just again, what I'm going to uh, just say here is there's a lot of great back and forth here. Um, when this session is done, Kathy, if you could leave a big marker up just a few more minutes, even after we're done, so that. Um, Folks can make sure they scroll through the chat. Um, I know they were paying absolute attention to all the speakers and no one was looking at chat during the presentation. Uh, but there are some great references that people have dropped in here. There are some links to some follow on reading, ASCE papers, whatnot. Chuck Harris makes a great comment about ECI. And without reading the entire paragraph, what this basically states is decision makers have got to be in the room. And that's absolutely right. You know, that's not a method to have seven levels of, of of folks to be involved and each one bumping it up to their supervisor to ask a question. So, uh, again, a uh, great thing uh, there as well. OK, um, I'm going to uh, do a rotating phone scan. Final comments uh, from my speakers, uh, Mike McAndrew. I'll start with you. Any closing comments? if I can get the mute button to work right. Um, listen, I, I really appreciate everybody being online, listening and being able to hopefully contribute through the, uh, the, the, the work group that's gonna get formed. Um, Cause I, I, I do wanna put more tools in our toolkit um, to give the, the DCAs and uh, AFCAC some more things to use and, and think about and to, in the delivery of the project. So anything that you guys, the industry can bring to bear um, to include, you know, the training aspect of this, because again, I think one of the things we, we, we fail to do ourselves is, you know, one of the biggest budget cuts we get is either travel or training. And so some, some of this is going to re be required. Uh, how do we teach this to all of our folks out there to make them comfortable using this, um, you know, these alternative methods. And so anything you bring to the table, uh, you know, just, you know, those kind of considerations be very helpful in this white paper. And, and uh, we'll take that and uh, we'll work through how to do well, what's, a, what's a, a policy versus a process. And we'll work with the DCAs to figure out how to get that stuff promulgated over. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And thanks for your leadership and support. I want to also want to give a, a shameless plug and thank the, uh, the Honolulu, Honolulu Post for sponsoring this. I really appreciate all the SME support on this activity. Over. All right, uh, I'm going to go in order of speakers. So, uh, uh, Pat, I believe you are next. Well, I just want to express my appreciation to you, Sal, and Mr. McAndrew, uh, General Green, or anybody else who had a hand in uh, helping me get here. This, this was an honor for Texas A&M. Uh, also, I just I would be really interested if there's going to be another wave of BRAC uh, or what the winds of change on Capitol Hill are looking like these days, because that's uh, we've got industry is is itching to get back into uh, lots of BRAC projects, and it could be exciting, exciting new future. So, uh, thanks, thanks so much for this opportunity. It was, it was really fun. 
Thanks, Pat. Uh, really appreciate your perspective. Uh, Mike Rossi. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I, again, I'm thankful for the opportunity and, and, and also what I can learn from my teammates here as we're, as we're going through this. I always pick up uh, more than a few things. Uh, I will tell you that getting the con I think we're in robust agreement getting the contract constructor early involved in the, in the design process is, helps the entire team. It, it helps them make a better design. It also gives you a better bid because there's less risk in the bid and there's less surprises. And, and you know, by the time you get a final price, it's uh, everybody knows everything about everybody else. At least that's kind of the goal in this thing. Um, and the last thing is, uh, we I don't know if it's human nature or it was army nature when I was in it, but everybody seems to think that the person that failed at trying something before did it because they were a dumbass and not because of anything else. So they always rip up the lessons learned and go about it themselves. And I'd say, don't be that person or don't be that agency, you know, you know, learn from, you know, brings right seat ride, as we used to call it in the army, you know, put the person in the vehicle next to you that's been there before and ask for how to progress on it. And there's, there's enough people in and out that, that kind of have seen all variations of these various delivery methods, methods tried. And it, it, it might help to get a hint or two along the way. So you don't step on the same toe poppers along the way. All right. All right. Thanks, Mike. I was wonder if we're going to make it through a Milcon delivery presentation without using the term dumbass. And evidently the answer is <laughs> All right. Um, Mike Costas. Yeah, no, I, you know, Sal, I appreciate the the time and, and having an opportunity to engage our my colleagues on the panel. And then, you know, the broader set of colleagues out there that are doing tough things every day. Um, alternative de delivery methods are, um, I think that the, the, um, arrow in the quiver um, analogy that was used earlier, Sal, is, uh, is kind of what it's all about. And, and we, can't, we can't just assume that on complex projects that you could select the same acquisition approach every single time and have, uh, have the right outcome. And uh, I think what we've expressed here is for complex jobs that are mission critical, there are different things that we can do and uh, all of which are successful. Um, but I, I think you're know, really at the end of the day, it's can we provide the taxpayer the best value uh, possible? And that's first and foremost in all of our minds. And but at the same time, give our warfighters the certainty around their missions. And uh, and that's what we have to be motivated to do. Uh, they need our help. And uh, I would say that the, the infrastructure is, is not getting any younger out there. And uh, the weapon systems that we're employing today um, have demands on that infrastructure that uh, are outpacing uh, its ability to support uh, you know, our people in the field to put themselves in harm's way. And that's what motivates me every day and my team. I work with great people and across industry and within Bechtel. But uh, you know, if this helps our acquisition community look at other alternatives, then we've accomplished our job here today. Great. So thank you. Super words, Mike. Well, um, you know, as I get ready to tie a bow on this, I, I just want to thank everyone who continues to put chat in there. It's great to see uh, General Seminite uh, joined us here today. I can see uh, Roy Augustine was out there and lots of others. So uh, thank you all for being part of this discussion. Um, thank you to my speaker. Seth, if you're still there, turn your camera on for a second. Uh, I want to uh, personally thank you in the Honolulu Post again. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure I just saw you there. There he is. Oh, look at that. Oh, we've got a little more scenery this time. Um, look, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I'm going to go ahead and put something out there right now. I, this was so highly successful with 400 registered and over 300 that attended with great question answer. We're going to have a white paper. We're going to go with a work group. I think that sometime in the not too distant future, the Honolulu Post needs to have another version of this, maybe alternative delivery six months later, let's call it, as an in-person event in Honolulu. Um, as long as I get to moderate, I think that is something we should absolutely look into. So I'm going to charge you with that and uh, figure out the best way to make that a reality. I'm waiting on your comments, Seth. All right, so Hey, well, I'll just give a plug for the Pacific Industry Forum that's going to be happening in September. Might be a great opportunity to continue some of these conversations. Uh, we'll look at that as being a forum, but that's going to be an in-person and virtual uh, opportunity in September. Great. Fantastic. Okay. Again, to all my speakers, thank you very much to the SAME staff uh, out of uh, Headquarter National who pulled this together. Thank you guys uh, pulling this together in such a short amount of time. Uh, to Honolulu Post, thank you uh, for being our host post. 
Uh, and again, uh, look forward to continuing the discussion and uh, we'll be uh, revisiting a lot of this here in a couple months at JETC. Thanks all. Have a wonderful rest of the day.